And then there were four. Welcome everybody to day two of the first ever OCC Ultimate. We're going to find out who will be walking away with the $1,000 grand prize. I am your host, Christo. I am joined here by Spooz and Darkness. We still have Bubbles and Flake waiting in the wings for the second series. And stay tuned a little bit later on today. Eileen will be joining us right before the finals to talk a little bit about esports in cards in the second half of this year. Before we get there, though, still plenty more cards action to be had. Before we dive into it, Spooz, I'm curious, any uh, big takeaways or highlights from day one? I mean, we had four insane series um, yesterday, starting with two five-game matches there. And yeah, then that 3-0 sweep from Birdo. So yeah, we had everything and it can be better today and will be better today. I'm pretty sure we had to have some cool pairings and yeah, the big final in the end and I'm really excited to to see who two players are competing there for the first ever OCC Ultimate Champion, right? There's something to be said for adding a little bit of, of prestige to that title for saying you were the first ever. What about you, Darkness? Any thoughts, any takeaways, any highlights from yesterday? My personal highlight was the first match had versus Tiger. Tiger lost the first two matches and we were very convinced that had had it in the back with bringing the meta decks versus Taiga, the only one not bringing the typical meta decks. But he made the re reverse sweep and catched head and was able to win three times in a row against the previously feared Soviet France control deck with a little bit of luck, of course, but also very good um, pro... Um, piloting of his aggro decks so that was great that was an amazing story and i can't wait to see more of tiger's performance today amazing and i think you nailed it you know that soviet control list was actually banned in a few matchups over the brit air that is typically banned um if you were here yesterday you saw that bubbles had actually coined the term abb always banned brit so we'll see what today has in store let's go ahead and bring up the bracket and show you exactly who will be competing here today for that title of first ever occ ultimate champion so as darkness just mentioned there you see a tiger with the comeback victory overhead three to two uh, no and five defeating our defending world champion Jaking three to two in a hard fought series. That will actually be the second semifinal we're going to show you today. We're going to start with the bottom of the bracket. So Jinlin had defeated Leo three to one, Berto Burrito three zero over Uwumoy. So we've got Jinlin versus Berto Burrito in this first semifinal. Keep in mind that the loser will move on to the bronze match. So all is not lost today. You don't go home. You get a second chance for that third place. So lots still to come but why don't we uh, why don't we jump into this matchup here so we're gonna see Birdo burrito versus jinlin quick reminder best of five with one ban so each player has brought four decks here let's dive in and do uh do a quick overview i guess as to what they're uh, what they're bringing so let's start with we've got jinlin on top here in this bracket so let's bring up jinlin's deck list and uh and spooze can you give us a, a quick overview of what we can expect to see here yeah absolutely um starting off with that U.S. German deck, we've seen a lot yesterday. Almost all the players are bringing that list. Seven out of eight players yesterday brought it. And I think today, all of the players that are... Oh no, Tiger is not bringing it. So still three of the four players are bringing that list. And it's a very versatile list. It's good in each matchup. It can win against everything. It's very strong. And that's why a lot of players are bringing it. And it proved yesterday how strong and, and yeah, just dominant it is at the moment. Then we have the Japan German list that has been in cards for forever, I guess. Um, there has always been a German, um, Japan German deck that has been very good, and it's still, yeah, it's still there and will be there even after the expansion that is dropping in the mid of this year, I guess. It's yeah, we just saw the strengths in several matchups. If you don't have enough healing, if you can't stop the early aggression, you're seeing yourself behind, and then yeah you're probably losing that match. And then we see Soviet France. Yeah, you, we just mentioned it a few seconds ago. A deck that did not perform too well for Head yesterday. And on the other hand, saw a lot of bans in other matchups. 
uh, yeah, it's a very versatile list that is mostly targeting aggro lists, but can also withstand in any other control matchup. Like you have a lot of value in cards like Tractor Factories. Party Dance is good in control mirrors because you can just steal the important units of your opponent and take, yeah, just utilize them for yourself. And then the third deck is not Brit Air. We've seen a lot of Brit Air yesterday. Jin Lun decided to use that Britain slot for Brit Germany discard. And yeah, we've also seen that one really, really dominant yesterday. And yeah, I also expected if it's not being banned, which would be a good idea for the opponent, we see doing a good job today again. Right on, Spoos. Thank you for that. Let's go ahead and dive into Birdo's deck list here. Uh, Darkness, why don't you take us through what Birdo has prepared for us? Birdo prepared a um, quite different lineup. Well, two decks are the same, but the first one is already very different. The first one is Soviet Japan Self-Damage. As the name implies, you are damaging your own HQ to get buffs or to make your units stronger. For example, the 456 Rifle Regiment is getting plus one, plus one stats and guard. And uh, the main body of this deck is the 34th Guards. It's a 6-6 infantry unit and the deployment cost is getting reduced every time by two credits when your HQ takes damage. So this is a fast, aggressive and explosive snowballing deck list. The second one is as a German ally, uh, the, the US with German ally frontline deck. Spoos already covered this deck. This is very dominant in the meta, very straightforward. You push into the front line with cheap units and capitalizing on the buffs of, for example, the Sherman uh, to get two card draws or the Blitzkrieg to give all units plus three attack and minus one operation cost to just all overwhelm your opponent by pure force. The third is probably the strongest meta deck right now. This is Brit Air. It is very powerful and can gain a lot of tempo early on. You have a lot of small air units like the Swordfish Mark 1 and Gladiator Mark 1. Uh, the stats are 1 and 3, so the bodies are quite decent. And these are fighters and bombers, so they can operate from the support line uh, along the entire battle battlefield and that gives you an advantage uh, in this current meta. And of course, with the close air support, you're able to scale those little bodies to overwhelm your opponent. And the fourth one, this is J Agro. It's another very straightforward, aggressive deck targeting directly the HQ, not only with small aggressive units, but also with chip damage, like from Akita Regiment, Mitro Regiment, and uh, the first Signal Regiment, damaging directly the HQ. Well, the Akita can be random, but everything here is straightforward, the entire lineup. And Birdo actually naming his Jagro list, um, Akita, don't fail me. We all know just how much he loves the random pings from the Akita. If we're looking at bands here, now Spoos, if you're in Jin Lun's shoes, yesterday we only really saw Brit Air get banned or that Soviet control list. Now, Birdo is not bringing Soviet control, bringing Soviet self-damage instead. Do you think the easy decision for Jin Lun there is to say, well, I'm just gonna ban Brit Air in that case? Um, since Birdo is bringing four more like aggressive deck lists, so Every other player has at least one control deck in their lineup, but Birdo has none of these. So, um, and since Brit Air is one of the strongest aggressive decks at the moment, yeah, I think you're good to go with with Brit and banning Brit Air there. Would you uh, Would you say the same? Darkness Brit Air just seems to be the easy decision here. Always ban Brit. I think it's it's the best the best choice in this matter to to ban Brit regarding this if this is a discard control list or Brit Air. 
I know a lot of players are respecting the Soviet self-damage if the player is very good at it because it's quite different mechanic and needs different counter tools, so it's harder to, to actually counter this one. Um, so maybe maybe we see uh, Birdo's self damage deck getting banned as well, but I'm expecting Brit Air. And what about on Birdo's side? Do you think he looks at that list or looks at Jinlin's lineup and says, well, my stuff's all a little bit more aggressive. I want that control list out of the way. Or, I mean, Jinlin's also bringing the discard version of, of the Brits, right? Which can be yeah. a little bit more control -y as well. There are two control lists, and I think the Brit control list is more dangerous because of the sheer amount of discard. Birdo has not teched against discard like the M4A1 or a um, higher amount of card draw of refill. So it's as soon as he loses his steam with those discards, um, he's better. Yeah, and we see both player banned Brit. The, I think this is the right decision. There you go. Everybody going Ooh. ahead and taking um, taking Bubbles' advice as we get right into the game here. Uh, Going to see that frontline list from Jinlun and Birdo bringing the self-damage list to kick us off. And Jinlun's mulligan looks very decent. He already has the 32nd Infantry Regiment and Greyhound, the 99th Infantry Regiment. Uh, and he on top found a dive bombing. This is like perfect start. And the second 99th Infantry Regiment as well. Jinlun is able to get an explosive start here. Birdo on the other side, he has a Yak 7. This could enable him because he's going first. He's able to drop this very fast and Jinlun can't, can't respond immediately. And one 34th guard is at least something um, two or three would be better of course now Jinlun finding red devils pushing those red devils into the front line would be the best idea here he agrees taking the front line with those extra credit necessary body Berto from the second draw, he gets the 456th Rifle Regiment and Bloody Sickle. He's able to make this a guard and protecting his little fighter jet. This is very strong for Berto to capitalize on those one damage and extra draw. 99th Infantry, uh, Infantry Regiment is able to buff the Red Devils for Jin Lun. What makes this unit very hard to kill, but not hard enough. Birdo already has a Red Dawn here, and he will use two credits to kill this dangerous Red Devils. And by that, he's able to drop the 300, uh, the 34th guards for zero cost. This is the power of Birdo playing self-damage. And Jin Lun now really needs to worry about this Yak-7 to stop Birdo from receiving more and more cards here. So I'm expecting the uh, the dive bombing coming in and killing it and flooding the board with 32nd Infantry Regiments, but this is vulnerable to Winter Warfare, so he may be looking into some different move. What do you think, Spoos? I mean, Birdo in a quite of a good spot here. Jin Lan had a good start, but... Birdo in a better spot at the moment, able to conquer the front line there. And yeah, Jin Lun not able to reconquer it. So that means that 6-6 six, six Buddy will find himself in the front line next turn. The only thing that's going against Birdo here is already down to 13 and kind of vulnerable to, to a Blitzkrieg now. Once we get later into that game and it could be good enough for Jin Lun to have a free front line and two tanks with Blitz plus Blitzkrieg and then you suddenly kill him. So Birdo really has to make sure that he's in the front line here, that he's dominating the match. And yeah, I think he's holding that Winter Warfare back for now, since he wants to get more value out of his Yak. And yeah, you can this... maybe you can get more value out of it later when, when Jin Lan just needs to deploy more units and then you hit even more with them. This Petliakov is very important here. You see the fifth ranger? The fifth ranger has a deployment effect get minus four operation cost or plus four plus four stats so by dropping this bomber he 
denied Jin Lun the ability to kill his big unit in the front line. Yeah, that was so important. Like otherwise, Jin Lun could have easily traded at six six out with the fifth rangers. But yeah, with that Petr Yakov, it would have only been a four four with four operation costs. So the worst out of two worlds, uh, not really what you want to have there. No, definitely not. Now with the Petliakov, he's able to kill one of the 32nd infantry regiments. Katyusha is able to kill the second one. Yeah. Uh, he decided. The question to with Katyusha trade. is: Do you overcommit into a potential strategic bombing? Maybe. So that that might be the reason why he traded the yak into it. He has an almost full hand here. Still has the chance to draw even more with scouting party plus winter warfare. So I think yeah, just sacrificing this yak there. Also, he's down to nine health now. Yeah, he don't saving want to save the more damage. HP. So yeah. And by deploying the tank now, he's actually not receiving damage because it Petliakov stopped prevented this uh, deployment effect damaging his own HQ. Third of playing conservatives regarding of his HQ right here. And he found the engineer's battalion. This will help him even more. Yeah, but Jin Lan's hand, I mean, sure, he has the fifth rangers that can probably take care of that 5-3. But other than that, there is not much not, follow up. It's not getting the deployment effect. Threat, so I mean. he d does not have enough Oh yeah, credits. there's still the Pedliakov, you're correct. But it's yeah, right. at, with 8 credits he can deploy this as a 4-4. Four, four, but still one turn away from that one. All he could do here was Threat Bomb. Um, Ooh, Bridge was able to do quite some damage, not enough. Only 11 with Hura. So... Was Threat Bomb in the correct play there? Wouldn't it have been a better idea to maybe drop a Sherman just to have the body on board? Just to have the body to trade. Yes, I agree. But nonetheless, it does not look good for Jin Lan here. That's, that's a little an... for Burdo next turn with Katusha and Winter Warfare. Even if Jin Lan clears the board now, which he's not able to do. Could deploy the fifth rangers now as a four attack, four operation cost unit, but even that would have not been good enough. And we have mm -hmm. another very dominant victory here for Burdo in match number one. And this is why quite a lot of people are respecting the self-damage. Uh, the self-damage deck is capable of producing a lot of big bodies. And if you are not, not able to shut it down immediately, like the Yak 7 turn 2, um, it's, it's snowballing. And yeah, Birdo managed gain the first victory here but it's best of five and everything can happen like yesterday tiger versus head uh it's far from over Jin Lung, yeah i mean no. if we looked at the starting hands i, I had a feeling that burdo did not have the perfect starting hand there only the yak but actually that, that yak carried him the game so that was yeah. really really dominant position there defending that yak with his life and in the end just yeah overwhelming um, Jin Lun here in match number one. But now we are in the Jagro Mirror. Jagro Mirror match. Birdo Burrito finds the opening uh, and the Panzer Befehlswagen. So he occupies the front line, following up with 22nd Infantry Regiment to gain more card draw. Down to three cards, two times type 93 and the Shiden. This is not what you want to see. Birdo really needs some more cards options. Cavalry Regiment looks kind of decent here, allowing Birdo to go into the front line again. I'm not even sure if he, he wants to, to play more. Maybe one type 93 or two. He's going. Oh, no, he's all very weak in. to desperate measures. Uh, he, ha he has a feeling he needs to go all in here. Hope that Jinlan is not having the desperate measures. I. Fortunately, Agree. he's not having it. Um, yeah. Birdo has to to do something here. And Jinlon is able to use the Akita Regiment, clear the front line, Ooh. and killing the 22nd Infantry Regiment. Birdo on the other side, finding the second 22nd Infantry Regiment. The card draw flows. Uh, three extra card draw here from Birdo Burrito. It's very necessary for this man. Jinlon on the other side finding Arado, finding Feint Retreat. Ooh, Not both being players able. with Feint Retreat now. Both players with Feint Retreat. 
So Birdo Burrito is just sending the Akita regiments into the front line, preparing for the next turn to going for a stomp or going for an instant feint retreat move here. Jinlun has quite some options here, not the greatest. Arado first trading away the dangerous 22nd infantry regiment and Wirbelwind into the front line. Akita hits the Wirbelwind, killing that. Birdo Burrito has no some options. So it looks like Birdo's uh, naming of the deck just paid out with Akita. Yeah. Don't betray and me. And they hit Birdo... the verbal wind and has the faint retreat up now. Uh, if you're Jin Lun here, do you also go for the faint to not fall be, um, behind too much? Or do you just play your hand first? He has a 22nd in hand plus Akita regiment. I don't know. Do he has think? two surprise attacks, so he can kill any big unit. He can go with Akita Regiment into the front line, 22nd Infantry Regiment behind, first killing Akita with his type. I think his deck is a little bit too strong here to instantly go for it. Maybe flooding the board now and uh, going going Faint Retreat next turn is, is a better move. No, Birdo. Bicycle Regiment into Archie. He's deciding to Ooh. trade first and Sender Regiment gets rid of the card draw here. Used 7 out of 7 credits. That was a fairly strong turn for Birdo. So I think if you're Jin Lan, you have to play the Feint this turn, right? Your hand is almost worthless now. I think otherwise you, you're just falling behind too much. You can play Sendai Regiment to to take Birdo Sendai and get back your unit. Play Calvary Regiment, Bicycle Regiment and pin the Archie. Um, it's still an efficient turn even without playing Feint Retreat. I don't know. If he's not doing it now, he has to do it next turn and is staring down an even bigger board and... He's having no play next turn. Sure, he has three units in the front line. But yeah, we will see how much this it's, is worth. This will get desperate measures, efficient. right? I think it's an efficient turn for Jin Lun. Birdo finding oh, Birdo bombing, bombing raid with, bombing with raid. Arado. Bombing raid is able to clear the front line or t kill the Sendai regiment. I think killing three units is very strong for Birdo here. Taking the front line with two cavalry regiments, even with the Sendai regiment. And now Jin Lung is on the back foot. He has. Oh, what a draw. He found the desperate measure. Desperate measures this turn. Look at that boost. He's even able desperate to clear measures the board and oh. feign retreat. It's even. It paid. That was Finally really a off. very good top deck. Wow. It was the best he could have gone there. Definitely the best. Yeah, what, what is Birdo doing now? He could drop the key to just have a big fighter body on, on, on the field. Maybe send Akita into the front, dropping the verbal wind. Or does he need to attack the Sendai Regiment to add more pressure? I think taking the front line is more important. Yeah. Sending Panzer 35T into the front line, dealing two damage looks fine. And Birdo has now the desperate measures available. So this this makes Birdo looking quite comfortable here. Jin Lun also oh, finding Both with the key on the board now. This will be a lot of draw for both players now. I think what do you think is Birdo doing with his key? Is he just going face or is he trading Jin Lun's away? Because both uh, it... also have to care about fatiguing here, right? If both are just equaling out their units in the front line, yeah. they will barely deal I, any I damage think... to the HQ. I think Birdo has to go to attack the HQ to threaten Jin Lun. So Jin Lun is looking into I'm getting killed next turn. Or I have to trade. And forcing the opponent to trade is the, the key right here. 
you want to get into the front line and being able to comfortable attacking the HQ, forcing the opponent to trade. What? Oh, the type! Type 9040k. This enables Birdo to pin the dangerous key of Jin Lan. So I'm expecting him to see, to see some pin action here. More units into the front line and starting to target the HQ. This type looks like the key for Birdo here. Correct me yeah, if I'm wrong. The problem is, if I see it correctly, Birdo is having the, the cards left disadvantage at the moment since he drew more cards than Jin Lan with the 22nd. So he's not winning the fatigue race right now and he's having an HQ health disadvantage. So yes, yeah, he needs to he close out to the attack. game soon, yeah. This is why he has to attack. Oh, actually he's going to, to trade away. Well, Desperate Measures makes it quite easy for him to trade. This is a different approach. Instead of locking the front, uh, the support line, just cleaning it and going for the damage here. Down to five Jinlun, not looking quite comfortable here. First 22nd Infantry Regiment, this will enable the Panzer 35Ts, and there are three of them. These are able to clear the front line. But the Jinlun needed the Sendai Regiment. There's no way to get rid of that key now. Is there a last uh, type 94? 94 TK? Yeah, key? maybe that's the only chance. Yeah. So far, Sendai too late. Played too. Sendai is too late and now he's out of credits. So the key 83 will win this game and Jinlun ceases and surrenders. Yeah, not even the lucky um, Desperate Measures top deck on turn 8 there prevented the, the fate there. That early feigned retreat for, for Birdo really key in, in winning that match. He just could push out units after units and yeah, just and overwhelm he, yeah. Jin Lan at the end. He had so many more options and this is why it's very important getting this feigned retreat early on just to give you the, the advantage of choosing what to use. Just by simply having more options, you are you are able to to find better options, and this is what Birdo did here. But it's not over. Um, will Jin Lun make the reverse, uh, the the comeback story again after we saw it yesterday happening one time, Tiger against Head? Now Birdo is choosing the frontline deck and. Jinlan sticks with J Agro. Going first, finding Bicycle Regiment and Panzer Befehlswagen. Look at that. Both units entering the front line. Birdo is having the Red Devils, is having the Chocolate Boys, the 32nd Infantry Regiment, but he's choosing to play dive bombing here to reduce the damage output. Maybe Red Devils would enable Panzer 35T the turn after. But before hitting those units, uh, it takes just so much time. So Birdo is now choosing to, to flood the board a little bit to be able to react. While Jinlun is having the 22nd Infantry Regiment and gets more card or more options and having feigned retreat in hand. Looking very comfortable, Jinlun here. This is an explosive start. Yeah, and Birdo can only respond with the 30 seconds so far, can clear the front, front line here, but after that he's only able to spend one more credit, which, which will be probably another 30 second, and that 20 second will do a lot of work for Jin Lan. Sure, he has the feigned retreat here, but that 20 second can maybe make it possible that he's yeah he doesn't he's not forced to play that feint on six maybe a little bit later but yeah as we as we saw earlier just one match ago it can be a, an error to to hold back that feint retreat and play your hand first because you yeah you miss a lot of cycling through your deck and even giving you even more options later on but i agree look at this three units in the front line birdo able to utilize the 35t here 
there will still be one unit remaining. And Birdo really has to make sure he's receiving little damage as possible, because besides that two, we can do it. He's not having any healing in the deck. And once yeah. Jin Lun finds the signal regiment, this problem could be even bigger. So he needs to manage his HQ health very well here. And so far, he's doing quite well. Turn four and only three damage received so far. Could be worse. Uh, Birdo is managing his HP quite well just by simply using dive bombing turn one to kill those bicycle regiments. Jindon on the other side has a ton of options. Look at those cavalry regiments. Jindon is flooding the front line, the space where the front line deck of Birdo desperately wants to go. Now, Birdo is still able to react. He has the red devil. I like your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I like this style. Just sending wave after wave into the front line. Jinlun is playing this so far flawless, very perfectly. Birdo now has to commit the verbal wind, looks like, and his remaining units in the front line to trade out those units. I mean, is he entering the front line or just dropping the red devils here? I mean, since it's turn six next turn, and Jinlon probably going to play a feint, maybe you, yeah, just drop something here and. Oh, the options. Feint is strong, yes, but Panzer 35T and the key 83. If Birdo is not having the half track, it's very hard to, to react. But of course, Jinlon knows about the half tracks of Birdo. So. Playing surprise attack and sending Dina and Akita regiment into the front line looks like a very smart move. As long as Birdo is not having the front line, the Shermans and the Blitzkrieg are basically dead cards. Uh, you don't want to play them. Yeah, I, I see why 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 Jinlon held back his feint retreat because yeah. The name of Birdo's deck is called Frontline, and the key part of Jinlan's strategy is here keeping Birdo away from it. But yeah, look at his hand now. He finds himself, the key is never going to stick on board, I guess. And he needs to play Feint now, and Birdo already having two units on board, plus more to come. I, I think... It's always tough to decide when to play Fane, but it feels like Jinan always playing it one or two turns too late. So far. I think this is the time to play Fane. Trade everything, uh, like the Hellcat and the Wibblewind. Yeah, you need to play it now. It, it makes no sense to play Key 83 into a frontline deck, which have two or three half tracks. Yeah. Actually, by not trading the Wibblewind, this forces Birdo to spend another credit uh, to, to trade here. And this was more damage to the HQ. So I think Jinlun played this pretty well here. Birdo now needs to find some options. He's choosing to sacrifice uh, to sacrifice Panzer 35T to have the Yeah, exactly. Look at this. Before this Shigen is getting pinned. Big cannot operate the Shigen just because the Wilbur is in the front line now. Really well played. Uh, instantly paid off. Jinlun has desperate measures. A little bit too late. Couldn't play it instantly. But Birdo has to... Should be aware of it. Using the half track now, I, I'm, I'm a little bit unsure if this is necessary. Of that one, move over into the front, trade out that other maybe to protect you. All that um, Birdo needs to make sure of is that he's not vulnerable to desperate measures too much here, I guess. So probably, is he having enough? No, he cannot operate it and attack and buff it with the 99. So he takes that one. Unfortunately, both will die to the desperate measures and that Shiden will have Free way at least a turn after, cause not enough credits now to deploy and attack with it and play desperate measures. But that desperate measures will be huge. Look how many units he's taking out. Four, five units. 
Yikes. Desperate measures killing five units. Oh, and the surrender from Burrow, yeah. Yeah, he's he's not able to come back against feigned retreat. First signal regiment on, on board. He just said, okay, impossible for me to win here. Uh, you got to take this. Let's go into the next one. And that's the first match that Burrow lost in this tournament so far On after a five-game winning streak. Yes, he, he stomped uh, Moy yesterday. Very impressive performance. Looked like another um, sweep so far today, but Jin Lun fighting back, finding himself still in a yeah kind of match ball um, scenario where when he loses the next match, he finds himself in the bronze match today. But yeah, Birdo definitely wants to close out that series in this match in the mirror this time. Ooh. The mirror front line deck, Birdo. Looks like sending away everything. Yeah, both players with a really player. bad starting hand so far. But um, yeah, both improved very well here. Both players starting with a 30-second infantry regiment. Very strong opening hands. Jin Lun looking for the engineers. Starting to go into the front line. This will stop Birdo from sending the Red Devils into the front line. And now he's going to drop a second, 32nd Infantry Regiment and a third one. Uh, not caring about the damage so far, not trading yet, but just sending the waves into this match. So, so does Jin Lan. He's going also to just drop those chocolate boys. But this enables Birdo from trading and sending the Red Devils into the front line. And having the Red Devils into the front line is not a scenario Jinlan wants to be in. He has to use so many resources now. Yeah, it's his whole turn, something. right? His whole turn to trade two 32nd into that Red Devils. And the good thing for Birdo, he's just having a second one in hand. So he can just, just do the got same. Just the second one, indeed. Yeah. Well, Jinlon oh, traded indeed. with the Combat Engineers, losing smoke good. screen. But um, trading, so this will survive. Birdo will take this chance by trading a Ray with Pencil 35T and sending a second Red Devils into the front line. Another option would have been sending Red Devils into the front line and buffing it with the 99th Infantry Regiment. But Birdo valued here getting, getting the value trade with Panzer 35T a little bit more. Now Jin Lun has to think, does he want to trade into the Red Devils again? Yeah, that's a tough decision now. You really want to have them off the board. Like, as you mentioned, if they're getting buffed with 99s, your problems are even increasing. So maybe it's a better idea to attack with the Greyhound and 132nd into that Red Devils rather than that 35T. Yeah, and that's what Jinlon is also seeing here. So far, Birdo, really good in just, yeah, staying in the front line with two Red Devils. Really tough work there for Jinlon to just conquer that back. That's been already four credits more to spend than usually to just get rid of those. And now double 109s. This is a lot very of good. damage. That's, that's very good against 5th Rangers. Those are just covering the 5th Rangers now with four attack. And that's a lot of damage already in the front line. Yeah, it is a lot of damage against the 5th Rangers. But Jindon is able to trade quite well with the Greyhound and the 32nd Infantry Regiment here into those 4-1 units and the Wirbelwind on top gets the value trade against Panzer 35T. So Jinlon holds quite, quite well. Yeah, usually the player that goes first is having the advantage in the mirror here. But yeah, Birdo just had too good of a hand. So Jinlon could not really, yeah, hold the front line for too long there. And so far, Birdo probably having a slight advantage here, as it looks like. I think it's all about the Red Devils. Birdo was able to get two Red Devils into yeah. the front line, forcing Jinlun to pay extra four credits removing them. And this 
gave Birdo the tempo advantage here. Jinlon now finally able to get back into the front line using dive bombing, killing the remaining unit, sending his own into the front. But Birdo has a ton, still a ton of options. He has the fifth Rangers. He has Hellcats, but they will get traded easily. So I, I wonder what's the, the move here. Maybe trading one combat engineer, sending the 5th rangers into the front line together with 32nd infantry regiment. I really like this play, sending as much stats as possible into the front line, occupying the front line and stopping Jin Lun from using those Shermans, as you can see. Yeah, 5th rangers are really important in this matchup. They're with the 4 health, they're very good in just occupying the front line and make it really hard for your opponent to yeah just reconquer it sure there's the half track that was going to bounce it but it, i think jinnon might use, utilize that patrol to get rid of the 30 second right and then just push up the wind, i guess um the problem with half track here is virtual has to spend zero operation cost to to use the fifth rangers again so there's no Ooh. tempo swing here and oh look at tempo that tempo 99 without deployment effect just to have stats on board that's really the situation you don't want to be in yes and with the 99th infantry infantry regiment the uh, this fifth ranger is getting buffed oh. again oh, eight, together nine. with we can do it and the combat engineers now there's an 8, 9 fifth rangers so looking at Jin Lun. Jin Lun would have needed two half tracks here to just get it rid of the board. But instead, Jin Lun's only real option is to plane drop the Sherman Birdo is lethal and hope with the Hellcat. The best. That's it. Hellcat, two Hellcats. Four plus... It's ten, 12 eight. plus 6 is exactly. 18. Exactly lethal. He's Quick also having mess. enough credits <laughs> if he sees it. I mean, I'm if pretty he sure sees he sees it. it. I'm pretty sure he sees it. <laughs> no, he's not. He's not seeing it. Oh, he still has enough credits. He can still do it. Wait, and what? No, no, he's not having enough credits anymore. Oh, you're correct. It's oh, he has. No, wait, 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 wait. We were line? wrong. We were wrong. To operate and attack Hellcat, he needs five credits. No, At four. Oh. Four plus Blitzkrieg. Verdu does not have Blitzkrieg. Oh, wait, am I blind? Oh, it was in Jinlan's hand. Okay, okay. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. mind. <laughs> what did I see? I mean, see, I told you, lethal. Well, uh, I was not cor yes. incorrect, see? <laughs> Birdo won. Well, Jinlan won himself in a really tough spot there with that 8 9 in the front line. Not really any chance to get rid of it. You, and... you calculated the mental game, and Jinlon noticed this as well. <laughs> Congrats to Birdo advancing into the final here. Jinlon is not out. He will play for the bronze match. And yeah, what an opening season. What a strong performance of Birdo Burrito. That's exactly what I wanted to bring up, Darkness. I mean, and I think you both mentioned it during that series, that Birdo's only lost one game so far, but... Every other game he's played has seemed like it was very much in his control. That frontline mirror didn't feel like he was ever really threatened. Um, Jin Lin playing pretty desperate towards the end of it. I think that that first series with the Soviet self damage deck, it's pretty obvious that he was in in good control of that as well. And I think Darkness, you brought up as well that Birdo is a very strong self damage player. So uh, probably felt very comfortable in that matchup. But it's been a dominating performance here thus far by Birdo Burrito. I think I think there was also a time, um, and I believe it was the last cast of the the OCC Clash where we were watching a uh, Jagro Mirror list or a Jagro Mirror match, and Berto said, "You always play feigned on curve. Just just play feigned on curve. You will be fine. Do it on curve." And we saw that happen twice where um, Jinlin played it probably a little bit later than he should have. Um, would you agree, Darkness, that hey, playing feigned retreat on curve is probably still the best solution most of the time? Most of the time, yes. Of course, there are scenarios where your hand is just too strong and the the value you're able to get with your current hand uh, is so so good that you can't miss that. But in general, 
getting the feint retreat early on, as early as possible, on curve turn six enables you in the long run, not, not for that turn, maybe not for the turn after, um, but turn eight, turn nine, turn ten, you will have so many options and this will give you an advantage. So we, we saw this with Birdo in the mirror matchup. He played it and he got it. The turn after, Jindon did not play on curve, but on because of his very strong options, but on turn seven to not miss the potential. And this was the only one where Jindon was able to beat Birdo. So in, in general, yes, always play feint retreat on curve. You, you will be comfortable doing it most of the cases. And Spooz, now seeing Birdo's performance here thus far, how well he has been playing, um, do, do you think he might just have it and be, be ready to go all the way here just based on the performance thus far and how dominant he's looked in his two, first two matchups? I mean, at the start of this broadcast, we were just yeah, shedding around. I was asking, and who's taking it home today? Yeah, and almost everyone agreed that that Birdo is the top favorite today. Like just um, how dominant he he won yesterday. Yeah, and we just saw how it continued today. And Birdo is so it feels like he's so comfortable in this tournament environment, and he knows exactly how to approach every matchup. He knows how to play his decks, and yeah, for me, he's he's the top favorite here today. I mean, sure, he's in the finals now, but yeah, he's just so dominant, and I think he's taking that home today. Let's take a look at the bracket. Let's see uh, Berto's path thus far, what he's got left to accomplish if he does want to take this home. Um, so there you see Berto defeating Jinlin 3-1, to one, making his way into the finals. He will face the winner of Tiger and No One 5 that we're going to have in just a moment here. Jinlin dropping to the bronze match where we will see them take on whoever is the loser of the Tiger No One 5 semifinals. Thank you, Spooz. Thank you, Darkness. Stay tuned, everybody. We're going to go to a quick break and get that semifinal over to you in just a few moments.
Welcome back, everybody. It is time for our second semi-final. We've got Tiger taking on Noen. I am joined by Bubbles and Flake. Uh, Bubbles, as we were getting ready to go, you're like, all right, it's time for the Canadians, kind of including yourself in that. Have you traveled across the pond and I don't, I don't even know about it? I, I am officially a an adopted Canadian. I contacted the Canadian government last night. I said, can I come in? Um, they haven't got back to me, but I'm just going to assume they've said yes. So we'll just assume that's what's happened in the meantime. So I'm I'm unofficially an official Canadian. Perfect. Flake, maybe you can head over to Ottawa and put the, put the stamp on uh, Bubbles' very unofficial application. I thought this was a democracy. Uh, I... <laughs> I did not get a choice in the matter, but uh, welcome aboard. We, we, have, we have plenty, plenty of thrift shops for you to shop at, Bubble. So you'll be a very happy camper here. We'll be all set. Um, before we get into the semi-final, um, you know, this is my first time chatting with the two of you today. Flake, any, uh, any highlights from yesterday? Any thoughts coming into today? Uh, highlights from yesterday, frankly. I, I just think that there's... Uh, a lot of back and forth in set many of the games. There are obviously a little bit of one-sided games here and there. You find a mad, bad matchup and the game is over in a blink of an eye. But there was also a lot of give and take uh, yesterday, which is good to see. Uh, a lot of no quit from certain players who eventually turned it around, which was uh, which was also just exciting. It just makes for good matchups. I'm hoping for more of the same today, frankly. Right on. And I mean, Bubbles, we saw a, a pretty dominating performance from Birdo in Series 1. Do you expect the same here with Tiger and Noen, or do you think it's going to be a little bit more of a hard-fought, drawn-out kind of battle? Uh, I'm personally expecting a 2-3 or a 3-2, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, that's what we saw from the up bracket yesterday, and I think that trend will continue today. Well, let's go ahead and get a little refresher on what decks these two folks are bringing here today in the second semi-final. Um, we're going to go ahead and take a look at Tiger here. Um, Berto, you want to walk us through Tiger's list? Probably the most, I'd say, um, unusual or atypical of uh, of today's lists. I mean, so, yeah, we've got the Japan aggro deck. Oh, no, sorry. We've got the Japan air deck. It's very, very confusing when you see a Japan deck and it's not Jagro, <laughs> um, which we have seen some people trying to bring, some people trying to make it work. A lot of this is to try and replicate some of the advantage of Brit Air. Obviously, you don't have some of these amazing sort of powerhouse cards like Monty or Close Air Support, but, you know, we still see a good amount of draw with the Lend Leases. We see the Empire Strikes, which is one of the strongest cards in the game at the moment. And then we do see stuff like Rule of the Skies to help you buff up your board a little bit then we do have brit air which i think everyone's seen everyone is used to so we're not really going to spend very long on that just once again if you've not done it already really you want to be two lend lease and then three or four convoy personally i prefer four but tiger's gone with the free convoy today and then we have this fast hines deck this is very reminiscent of decks of the past um fast hines used to be a really really popular and really meta deck but it did get pushed aside for either quicker decks or decks that were more consistent with the front line stuff like jagro and us front line so it's good to see that sort of come back a little bit it does have some very strong cards in there so things like enigma things like the the auto cannon things that most other decks can't fit in at the moment you know jagro you want to get this feigned retreat consistently and front line there's just not really a slot for enigma so you do get to take advantage of some of these really powerful cards that other decks can and it's just a very fast moving deck in general especially with things like all these 1k units and the grife and stuff like this and then we have the the Soviet self damage deck. Now, the more traditional way to do Soviet self damage is to do this Japan ally with the 33rd Raccoons. This is just a, a little bit more popular at the moment. You know, you can get a lot of draw going with these winter warfares and things. Um, but instead, we see here Italy ally. And the only Italy card they're actually bringing is Matt Nostrum. Now, this helps you stabilize your life total against more aggressive decks like Jagro, stops you being Blitzkrieg quite so easily by something like a US frontline deck. But it does also also enable you to run this five-year plan five-year plan was something some people had experimented with with the japan ally but it just proved to be too much damage and you didn't have enough time to take advantage of the cards you were drawing from it but now with man nostrum in it you know you can play five-year plan and a lot of the cards you're going to draw are going to be cheap such as man nostrum itself which you can then utilize almost immediately and just stabilize your life total afterwards right on now flake do you think that you know 
we we kind of saw Tiger's lineup yesterday and looked at it and went, eh, I don't know. I don't know about this. Not bringing the typical meta decks. Do you think there is an advantage at this point of bringing things that maybe players have not prepared for or aren't exactly expecting um, in an event like this today? Well, surprise factor can only take you so far. Oftentimes, you know, before deck lists are published or whatnot, day one of tournaments in general are usually the days where you do have the surprises. However, day two and, and further on, that's where people can adjust and, and really study what the, a particular player and the list that they're bringing in. So surprise factor can only go so far. You still also need to couple the surprise factor with, you know, some kind of actual effectiveness against your opponent's list, your more traditional meta list. So um, we'll see how Tiger approaches this with this particular set of lists, which it, like we've seen all weekend is a little bit more unorthodox. But again, uh, he, he got through day one playing against those types of lists and within that meta. So we'll see how this uh, this fares today. And Tiger being the only player who actually had uh, any type of upset yesterday, we had the second, third, and fourth seed move on, and we had Tiger defeating Head as the uh, eighth seed defeating the first to move into the semifinals. So definitely something working there for Head. Let's take a look at Noen's lineup um, and see exactly what Tiger's going to have to deal with. Um, this one, Bubbles, looking a little bit more familiar uh, than what we see on Tiger's side. So this here is almost a complete reflection of what um, no one has been bringing to the OCC clashes. You've got this USA uh, frontline deck, very, very consistent deck, very popular, and for good reason. It's just, it's possibly the most consistent deck in the game at the moment, alongside quite conveniently Britair, which is the next deck to look at here. Uh, we do see cards like Paris C in here. We do see the four Lenleys and the two, and the sorry, the two Lendleys and the four Convoy, put it in your decks at home. But then we do see some more far out there stuff, which we don't see from other people, things like the 26 Engineer Regiment. Now this has a deployment effect where it gives plus two HP to all your current units. This sort of acts like a mini, we can do it. It makes your board a little bit more resilient to things like Stars and Stripes, strategic bombing, and just things that are going to attack your back line very, very quickly and try to punish you for going wide in the support line. So that's why we see the inclusion of something like this. Then we we see once again this pretty standard Jagro deck, nothing too crazy here. Um, we do see going down to the two orders being the optimal way that most people are playing this. We did see Berto having the bombing raid, which most people don't have. So we may see people circle back to that if Berto is able to have much more success with it today. And then we have this Soviet USA sort of ramp control deck. This is very similar to the Soviet France control deck, but it's just a little bit more greedy in the late game. We've got stuff like B-17 in here. We've got things like tractor factories, and we have ramp to help us reach that late game. Um, some of the big factors that make people want to play this usa version are cards like war machine and fifth rangers both of which are really really you know strong staples and work really well together you could do war machine on turn two and that means next turn you can go straight into the fifth rangers and you can start operating that every turn it just means you're able to keep up with these aggressive decks like jaguar and us frontline a lot more than other control decks might be able to Definitely the the addition of ramp to that list makes it a little bit more flexible, give you a little bit more staying power, like you said. Um, let's let's do this the other way around. Instead of asking for predictions um, around the bands, because Bur uh, Bubbles, I, I feel like I know exactly what direction you're going to go. Um, why don't we take a look at what the bands are, and we can come back and take a little um, analysis of that after the fact. So let's take a peek and see what we got here. Um, so no one is losing the Brit list, but um, Tiger losing Japan. Sorry, Bubbles, what? I mean, we've seen this a few times. People don't think they need to ban Brit. They think, you know, I can counter Brit. And I'm very interested to see what exactly it is no one thinks makes them able to counter the Brit deck so effectively. It might be the confusion. It's just a little bit interesting because out of these two air decks, Brit is generally considered the much stronger variant. And then this Japan one is brought in, you know, as, as a sort of backup to try and emulate it. So it's very interesting to see that it's been swapped out. I think part of this might be is Tiger's Japan deck has things like zeros and it has banzais things which are very good against soviet control and you know a lot slower so it might just be that you know no one saying okay i will ban the slower deck and i will beat your quicker deck i'm still i'm still so thrown off by that i'm gonna ban an air deck but not the good one the one that you don't see very often flake do you think that can come back to that again that I don't want to call it a surprise effect because you do have the deck list. You know exactly what's in it, but can it come down to just the, hey, I haven't had time to scrimmage against that list. I wasn't expecting to see it. 
I don't know exactly how I'm going to beat it. So I'm going to take my line with, I know Brit Air. I've played against it a multitude of times. I know how to deal with it. Like I've said, I've seen this uh, countless times where somebody shows up to a tournament in the Swiss rounds and just goes haywire because people are not prepared. But ultimately, at the same time, you still need that deck to be able to beat a, a, a world-class player playing a world-class deck. So, um, I, you know, if there, it's a strategy that can work, uh, but you need to have the way that you shore up the fact that there might be a gap between the actual power levels of the two decks the the surprise factor sure but it's a short-lived advantage the difference that you have to have is that uh the player playing the unorthodox deck has to have you know as many reps into the meta decks which will then basically close that gap because the opponent is not going to have the same type of, of familiarity in all these scenarios where you have the cards that are not very seen very often or the deck that's not played to to uh too frequently you'll have all those advantage in your testing and in your ladder grinding, which that should, like I said, shore up that that's that power level gap between the two decks. And and Flake, you bring up a really good point. And I'm curious as to Bubble's opinion about this because obviously Brit Air, again, we've talked about it a million times, one of the best decks in cards, often banned, ABV, all that good stuff. Now, that Japan list is kind of the reverse of it, right? Where you're getting a little bit more um, on the air side, trying to take some of that magic from Brit Air. But we've seen it a few times in OCCs, and I feel like it's gotten mixed results. So to Flake's point about, hey, that deck still needs to be good. It can't just be a surprise. Do you think that deck is as threatening um, as, you know, no one's giving it credit for here? I'm not sure it's as threatening as Noah might be saying it. I, I think overall it relies far more on high rolls than the Brit Air list because in Brit Air you have four copies of Cass and Cass is something you can use to close out a game very, very quickly. You can sort of have these smaller, you know, not so threatening air units and then very suddenly they become win cons and they're just going to close out the game on their own. And you also just have access to more card draw. And I think something people don't always realize about competitive card games is generally card draw is seen as king. Uh, you've got these very quick decks that can do a lot of stuff very quickly, but if you don't have the card draw to back it up, most high skill players will have the knowledge and the know-how to slow down your aggression and then win just through resources. So I think the Japan deck relies a little bit more on high rolls and has a little bit less card draw to offer, but when it does high roll, it can be extremely threatening for something like a Soviet USA control deck to deal with. And we're just waiting for the players to get queued up here. We promise it's not that we like flapping our gums, um, but we'll uh, we'll do our best to keep you entertained while we're getting the players into the game. And Bubbles, you uh, you talked about it a little bit when we were going through the deck list, like convoy times four, land lease times two, every single time. Is that exactly what you're talking about here? Just card draw is king, so those pieces need to be in there. I mean, we've seen it time and time again. A Brit Air list looks like it's in trouble. It looks like there's not much they can do. And then, you know, they find a Lendlease off the top. And from a Lendlease, they find a Monty. And then suddenly you're looking at the hand and you're like, there's two or three bombers in this hand and an Empire Strikes. Now that's the board gone and a huge burn to your face as well. And then before you know it, what seemed like there's no way this Brit Air list can win has just become completely flipped. And you're just thinking, I don't have the tools to respond to this anymore. And is, is part of that also the aspect of, because Lendlease is not a cheap card, right? We're getting later in the game. That's that's taken up the majority of your credits. Is it the fact that they have some cheap answers, things like Monty that can at least stabilize the board? So you can say, okay, I'm going to draw my cards. I'm going to pause the game for a turn, and then I'm going to reestablish my board. I, I think Monty is definitely a big aspect. You also have the Type 94 to take into consideration, especially if you've played this earlier in the game and you have the surprise attack sitting in your hand. You can then play Lendlease with the knowledge that, hey, if I don't find my Monty, I have this surprise attack and I can at least pin down the most aggressive unit and just buy myself a little bit more time through that method. And then obviously you do also have um, the Convoys and the Shalling. It's sort of a, a reverse of the Lendlease into Monty, where you have big expensive draw into cheap pin, you can have a, a cheaper, less sort of potent draw engine into this shalling and just pin down the board in effectively the same way and still help you build up your hand size a little bit. Now, Flake, you've been playing a, a fair amount of Brit Air in preparation for, for casting this event. You know, what's, what's your experience been with it? Is it the fact that, hey, I can drop a bunch of bombers to kind of hide on the back line. They've got decent health totals so they can keep things stable while I go ahead and draw? Because I'm sure you will agree with Bubbles when he says card draw in card games is king. 
Card draw in card games is king. I mean, like you mentioned, uh, just to sort of touch upon the previous point there, the fact that there are so many options that on a 12 credit turn, if you do just lend lease off of, like, if you top deck a lend lease, you're still getting extra options. And of those cards you're drawing, you can find, a, a, with the remaining credits, an opportunity to just freeze the board. And then you have more cards to reply with the following turn. Now, my experience with Bird Air has been that, um, you know, it, it starts off so potently but it's kind of it kind of flounders a little bit in the mid game once your opponent can get past you um and the one thing i found is that the meta has adapted you'll see a bajillion stars and stripes or eagle claws or ways to just go ahead and and attack your backline without any kind of board presence so it's a very feast or famine list i find it it, it has been um dealt with with more tech choices and and better opportunity to to just attack that particular list is it still the list to beat it is and the way that you you know basically determine its power level is how the rest of the meta has adapted to play in its sandbox as it were but um i guess it's it's time to play as we're uh hitting up our second semi-finals here for a trip to the finals of the occ ultimate no and dropping the irregulars that is a, a fairly new card bubbles and and i found that this card is kind of it, it creates such an uncomfortable presence for even the most aggressive lists it, it certainly does that six uh six hp it comes with is just such an intimidating amount there's nothing which costs this few credits and just offers this such a high level of defense and we also see there's there's actually tools in Noah's deck to call, do some very cool tricks with this card you see this euro factories and this red banner in no one's hand what this means is no one can attack a unit and not have the irregulars die and then you can actually, you know, sacrifice the unit and upgrade it and trigger this destruction effect. So Tiger might have a unit in the front line at some point and think that their unit is perfectly safe, but then no one can do this trick where you hit it with the irregular, the irregular survives, and then you pop it with one of these, um, these upgrade cards, and it once again just clears whatever it was going to clear beforehand. So just a neat little trick, maybe not too relevant in the Brit Air matchup because there's not too many cards in the front line, but if uh, Tiger is able to take this game it's definitely something to look out for moving forward against stuff like uh maybe the heinz deck or something like this close air support is going to give everybody a little extra love here as you can see that those bombers are doing the work they can just go right over the top of these irregulars how much of a trouble is no one in here he's got the credit advantage he went war machine oh into the confusion and the engineer so this is an almost perfect top deck you chuck down the engineers you confusion something and you can euro or red banners it you get rid of one of tiger's units and you gain how for the engineers in the process there's the confusion stealing a unit that costs three or less picking up the hefty bomber we're gonna drop the engineers as well there's the the trade or and the, the euro They're factories incredible change of pace over here again that is one of those answers that has plagued me as i was playing brit air for a while so actually a very interesting unit. I believe this is the Makawa Regiment. It is a 4-4 four, four for free credit, so it's very stat efficient. It does have Blitz and it does have Alpine. But its big downside is it has the deployment ability of when you play it, it increases your hands cost by one. So if Tiger ever bounces this, it sort of puts no one in a situation where they may actually not want to replay this unit. Surprise I attack. Imagine oh, there we go. There. The engineers. Yeah, it's just too potent of a healer. It just heals you so quickly and so effectively. And we've seen a lot of CCGs. Healing is one of those things which is very easy to misrate and not completely understand. Um, especially, you know, people thinking healing is better than it is. But engineers are one of the outliers where they just heal you at such an efficient rate for what they cost that they do become a real problem for any aggressive deck. With the Albacore in hand, as well as the Empire Strikes, uh, they were still a turn or two away from actually just laying waste to this board. In fact, that Empire Strikes could have been devastating for no one. Unfortunately for him, though, the confusion just solved all that problem. But an 8-8 in the front row, this is going to have some trouble for those bombers. The bombers are not going to trade efficiently with this 8-8, but it's going to be an expensive operation. However, with uh, so much ramp in no one's list, he already is leagues ahead in terms of his economy, but... Pinning that down with the Sexton's a good start. How much of a problem is this 8-8? I mean, if no one can find a way to get rid of this section, it could become very, very problematic. No one also has the option to red banner or euros it if they don't think there's ever going to be a way to free it up. We do see some very good options here. If you take the 39th, you can then take that swordfish, lift it up and start attacking back. 
I think this is looking to the point where on board presence, this is really no one's hand, uh, no one's game, sorry. But then if you look at Tiger's hand, this Albacord Empire Strikes could just swing this back in his favor instantly. It's a little bit unfortunate that you've lost the Swordfish. So that's one less bomber. Um, but if you're able to clear this, this Sexton, then it could just be GG on the spot. And this A8, like you say, is such a problem for Tiger to deal with. The stats in no one's favor here. That Sexton doing its best to just stay relevant. We're going to be pushing the irregulars forward, protecting the 8-8 if necessary, but it's going to remain pinned as long as that Sexton's on the board. There are options here, as there is a Swordfish in the back row that was buffed by um, some close air support. It is probably looking to hunt down that Sexton and just clear the board, freeing up the, the <laughs> sheer beef of the 8-8. We may see the Wrath Lightning come out on the Swordfish, and when this gets sent back to its owner's hand, it actually goes back to Tiger's hand, which allows Tiger to set up this Empire Strikes next turn. It's a very interesting interaction where when something returns something to its owner's hand, it's not the player that's in control of it, but the player that originally had it in their deck. So it's something where you're very much able to play around these stolen cards and use it to your advantage with stuff like Wrath Lightning. Partisans for Noen is a very, very, very strong card here. You're able to pick up this Sexton. You're able to pick up this Wrath Lightning. You're even able to pick up the Wrath Lightning, trade into the Sexton, and then Urals of Red Banners it. And this is sort of what we saw when Partisans and Confusion first dropped into the game. This was the meta, and it's really interesting to see it coming back so heavily for Noen's ramp deck. Finds a 3-3 artillery as well. A great way to just go ahead and take out some of those uh, those planes in the back row. But I think at this moment, no one's thinking, I don't even need to worry about your your uh, bomber situation here. Because, um, you know, an 8-8, eight, eight, a 5-5, five, five, even with Empire Strikes, it's going to be quite the tall task to deal with this. And it doesn't look like he's got the bombers ready for it. He's just going to opt to go for a three, uh, a three spot around the board, which is a good start here. It does take out the artillery. Still an 8-8 eight, eight to deal with the 5-2, however is uh, still remains alive, but air superiority should deal with that problem and quickly an equalized board, but still the major threat being that 8-5 in the front row. What I want to draw attention to, though, is look at Tiger's hand, the Lendlease and the Convoy, and then look at Noah's hand. Two War Machine and a card which actually goes down on card advantage. This Red Banner, you have to sacrifice a unit to upgrade it. So actually, in Noah's hand, essentially no extra additional ways of putting extra presence on the board or into your hand. So if Noah isn't able to find some card draw, I think this is just going to be Tiger's game through this you know, card draw alone that Britta has you know backed up with this uh, empire strikes as well able to just clear the board reset the board refill your hand and then close out the game from there no one's ability to actually generate a, a massive unit there the 8 8 has essentially been completely punchless and you could war machine all day long if you don't have cards to draw it doesn't really matter and uh, tiger like we mentioned on the, the shelling what a brilliant start here again that 8 8 has been completely punchless now shelling actually is going to get uh, of some decent uh, work here because it is going to shave uh, one of those ramped up credits and I don't think he gets it back. Not that it matters with that little card in hand, but the important aspect here is that no one's 8-8 eight, eight has done precisely nothing. It has taken a walk to the, the front line, but with all of those bombers, all that air force, this is, looks like it's going to be over in a hurry. We can do it. Not the worst find ever. Gives you a little bit of extra health, and it does just give you a little bit more room to work around in. But the hammer is possibly the worst thing you could find in this scenario. Yes, you can take out the Type 94, but you do not want to be spending your entire turn's card draw taking out this Type 94. With this buff in Tiger's hand of the naval supply run, this is really starting to look like deep, deep trouble for Noen. And he may be starting, starting to consider just going for this red banner in the hopes that he can find something to just do something about this board. Playback to Tiger. Still has the lend -lease. It's an expensive endeavor, but it does give you quite the advantage of options, which at the moment, no one is sort of very, very lagging on as... Uh, here comes the lend -lease. We're going to draw four, see if we can't find any options. More card draw. There's another Empire Strikes. Doesn't look like it's going to be enough to do what it needs to do. But again, you're inching closer here. Um, I don't think there's a way to negate the 
So... I, I think you just have to accept that something is going to die to it, and instead you just sort of move on and figure out how you're going to close out this game as quickly as possible. So we see Tiger going face, trying to set up this this big buff. You've got Empire Strikes to you know clear the board, do some extra burn. But then you also have this naval supply run. I imagine Tiger's game plan at this point is end the game as soon as possible. And no one thinking about just trying to face they face race this. A very, very brave way to take this, but with Tiger's hand size being so big, I don't see any real way in which no one can win this game via value. So it's very interesting to see that the face race is something that no one has decided is the optimal route. And yes, it's still very unlikely to win the game, but sometimes you look at a game and you're like, I have a 5% chance to win if I trade, and I have a 10% chance to win if I hit face. Yes, I'm still banking on a 10% chance, but it's just the best mathematical option I have. You play to your outs, it's the way to go, and this is going to be one hell of an over uh, overpay on killing a 1-1, one, one. but an 8-7 in the front row has finally connected, bringing Tiger to essentially a, a two-turn clock if it goes unpunished, but here's the Empire Strikes. It's not going to get everything done. It's going to keep that 8-8 eight, uh, eight, eight down to an 8-4 in the front right, but there's a naval supply run that should finish the game as the planes do the work, We're clearing out the fighter that was guarding the HQ. Bombers have a have clearance to drop payload that is the end tiger takes it brit air under severe pressure bubbles actually got through that one and i think this just speaks true to the to the acronym always ban brits you know and they're for good reason with the card draw they have the empire strikes the board presence it's just such a threatening deck and even when you've built a deck to beat it you know saying yes i've equipped my soviet control deck to better beat brit air we saw the confusions we saw the 39 infantry which takes control or something no one had so many tools to combat brit air but when you're up against brit air even if you have all the tools and all the right pieces the deck sometimes just crushes you anyway. I mean, there's another way. You can always ban two decks by just losing to the good one, right? That just that is, it that is, you know, get it over and done with. Always, it's, uh... It's deck selection AoE is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so no one up, uh, no one should be up one nothing. I bet. No, sorry, Tiger's no, up one nothing. Tiger's up get... one nothing, yeah. Right, um, the Brenner gets through, and now some of the more unorthodox lists that we're going to see Tiger bring to the party, I believe. Uh, he's got some... Uh, it's, it's this is the Tiger's... Fast Hines list for Tiger. Right. Um, so cool because of the card Fast Hines, which actually a lot of Fast Hines decks don't run anymore. It's become one of those interesting things where the deck is named something, and then the name piece of the deck has often been rotated out for other cards, but the deck's retained its name anyway. Tiger quickly establishing the Panzer to clear out the air support here and still maintaining some presence in the front row. It's Lots very of important to, to get rid of that Yak the moment it comes up. It offers so much card draw so quickly that, you know, you can sort of think, yeah, it burns the face and maybe I can just face race this. But it's just not worth it compared to the card advantage that your opponent's going to get. You know, life is a resource and it's giving your opponent a trade at far too of an efficient rate. Now, no one here opting to go with the War Machine to ramp up uh, an extra credit here. Do you think that he's thinking, okay, I have time, I've got some leeway here, the board doesn't look too scary, I could ramp, maybe go into War Bonds, and then take full control? Or is is this just a matter of not wanting to drop the Chaika? I, mean, I think when you drop the Chaika, you open yourself up to be value traded really efficiently by any future Panzer 35Ts. But then also, when you are playing a ramp deck, the quicker you play ramp, the more early you can take advantage of it. So you want to play ramp as early as possible without giving up too much board, without giving up too much health. So I imagine it's just no one looking at the board and saying, I don't necessarily know what I'm ramping into because I can play the same card next to it anyway. I just know that while I have an opportunity to ramp in relative safely, I'm just going to take advantage of that opportunity. A 3-5 guard is a nice hefty piece of, ch you know, chunk of meat to sort of be a, a little bit of a shield towards all the damage that is being sent towards that HQ. The fast Heinz list does want to operate fast and furious. This couple of tanks in the back row that operate for free are going to be, you know, hunting for that HQ. But uh, a big body blocking this is makes for very inefficient trading as... That one body, frankly, just meets up perfectly against everything in its way here. So uh, no one finding the right card at the right time with no immediate answer from Tiger. 
And I mean, for anyone who's not familiar with this card, you know, some viewers who may be newer to the game might not have seen First Rifles yet, but it has the destruction effect where it spawns in a second guard afterwards. So to deal with this, really you want Sendai so you don't have to deal with that destruction effect. But now no and finding the armored train, you know, a very, very tanky and defensive unit with free attack, able to kill most things on its defense and heavy armor one, but also spawning in these, you know, constant onslaught of light infantry is going to allow no one to slowly trade away with this board you know get rid of these bicycles the tide 94s it's going to be a little bit of a problem for tiger and we may see the double surprise attack come out and just get rid of this uh, armored train as soon as possible yeah throwing out the one one that operates for free is a great way to just clear out some of the mess in the front row but like you mentioned if you can get rid of that then you're in uh, you're in business here and no one now with seven credits to play with wants to make some space in the front row is going to clear out uh, the infantry, the couple tanks still left to be uh, to be dealt with, but there's no efficient way to deal with them. You're not going to use the train. You're just going to go ahead and drop another air unit. And there's the uh, the one the one one little weenie that pops out of the train. Says hello, hello friends. Yeah, he's bit, he's got a short life to him. He might not realize it, you know. But he's he's a cheery fella. Little does he know that his uh, his sole purpose is to be sent into certain death into a German Heinstadt. Look at his face. His face is like, ah, oh, oh, hello. And then little does he know that, uh, yeah, you are not long for this world. However, we do appreciate it. Thank you for your service. But uh, ultimately, it's going to get chewed up by something. Um, unfortunately, this Someone's guy got to do it. Uh, so, yeah, the, well, the train's gone, my friend. That uh, robust, beefy, uh, just wall uh, that was pooping out dudes is is long gone now it's a little bit more of a free ride there's still a guard to deal with however you are able to fire on top of it that artillery can certainly get a lot of work done and uh, it looks like no one doesn't necessarily have all the right answers right now and with that active ability of wherever you deploy, whenever you deploy a unit, the auto cannon doing one extra damage to face. We see Tiger just trying to dump as much of his hand as possible, not worrying too much about trading and just saying, you know what? If you can't answer this auto cannon, I'm going to win the game through hitting you for free every turn, plus the extra ability I get from deploying units. As it stands now, just even the the two seventy second. I mean, that's that's a hefty piece here. Like, don't get me wrong. But like you said, as long as no one can just populate the front, uh, sorry, as long as Tiger can just maintain control of the front line, then that tank is going to be difficult or that, you know, it, you're not going to have access. And at the end of the day, just the chip damage, the attrition from like, the auto cannon, like you mentioned, can get the job done. So, so no one doing his best to clean up here, but it's uh, not the easiest. We may see no one try and use this Yak-9 soon. You do have to deal with the Whirlwinds first, but the Yak-9 is quite an efficient way of dealing with the auto cannon. We see no one dropping all the way down to five. Tiger going to be able to deploy quite a few units from hand and just drawing so many cards from this 22nd infantry in the back line. You're essentially drawing at double the rate at your opponent is. Chipping away. The front line still held rather you know, efficiently double the bodies there. That's a safer bet here because the 272nd is likely going to go ahead and trade up with one of these, and then it will create a Yosef style. And the problem is, is like we mentioned, look at that life total getting being chipped oh. away. And I, I don't want to speak too soon, but this might be GG. If no one can figure out a way to deal with this auto cannon, it's going to hit face free damage next turn. And then all Tiger has to do is deploy two units from the hand, which is going to be no problem whatsoever. So if no one can find a way to protect their HQ or to find a way to deal with this auto cannon, I do believe that is going to be game. And no one and just thinking about, is there any way I can get out of this? He's thinking definitely, and uh, cards like the War Bonds there are just sort of just sitting there, you know, not a exactly. A little bit, a but... little bit too slow, yeah. I'd really have liked to see this Yak come down last turn. As you know, you're fairly secure because of the destruction effect from this first rifles giving you two guards. And if you don't deploy it last turn, you put yourself in this scenario now where you're just thinking, actually, how do I deal with this auto cannon? So as it stands, like you mentioned, yeah, the, the HQ is guarded from ground attack. Unfortunately, the artillery is going to pepper it a little bit more. Even if you have seven credits to play with here, no one doesn't necessarily have the best things that you can do. But the Yak-9 coming, like you mentioned, just maybe had a turn too late. The back row is well populated with a lot of effective units for no one, but it has the auto cannon that has been chipping away. As you can see, three more damage. You just got to drop two units. 
plenty of credits, plenty of space. Looks like Tiger's just gonna crush this one in a in a rather cheeky way. And yeah, this this auto cannon just sort of cheesing out the game, and even just for one damage a turn, it really adds up. Sort of reminiscent of the Signal Regiment, where it's just slowly chipping down the HQ, and with no one not able to find any way to steal the burn, Tiger taking an early 2-0 lead and putting no one very far on the back foot. Tiger has just that uh, Soviet list left to punch through with. No one has his op his options here. What do you think, No one? What's the best stop to this last list here? Well, you know you're against self-damage, which is a very quick and tempo-aggressive deck. So I feel like you want to play something which can keep up with the deck. I think no one might have a hard time if they bring this Soviet list. Now, I know a lot of people see this sort of situation and think, well, no one has to win on every deck anyway. But that's a really bad mindset to have because... I'd rather be 2-2 knowing I need to win with this deck, which is a hard matchup anyway, than being 2-0. You know, that mental state you can put yourself in is really quite important. But we see no one fully confident in their Soviet list saying, I will bring in a third time and I will do my best for this matchup. And, you know, hopefully for no one it can work out a little bit better. We do see the OT-34 in uh, Tiger's hand. You know, this is one of those cards that some people love, some people don't. I know Baron Von Glowup, who may be watching a, a very sort of popular player, reaches a lot of these tournaments. They are a huge fan of this card. And personally, I'd really like to see this OT34 OT come at some point distant tournament. And comboed with this counteroffensive, it can do so much damage so quickly. So both players, a full mulligan potentially for no one here. Doesn't like anything that he sees here. Even the regulars, I feel like that's a card that you would probably want to hang on to, but maybe I'm wrong here. What are you looking for if you're no one here? A full and ultimately aggressive mulligan. It's a pocket it's... of more ramp in there than you could probably hope for at this moment. Uh, two war machines and the war bonds, the yak. So there's nothing that really no one's going to be playing for a little while here. The good news, I guess, for him that there isn't much board development on Tiger's side either. So he's going to take advantage of this, going to ramp up to four credits on the following turn. And then likely it's going to be either the fifth Rangers, you feel, or if nothing hits the board here, are you merely just ramping again I with another War Machine? Keep going. I think you go the War Machine into the War Bonds and you just keep ramping yourself as much as possible. One of the interesting things about this Soviet self-damage deck is it's really quick on tempo. It's really, really aggressive, but it relies on doing damage to itself. And it can't actually do damage to itself if it doesn't have anything to target. You need targets for the Red Dawn. You need targets for the Sickle. And you really don't want to be playing Winter Warfare on an empty board. So no one is actually able to ramp very effectively and not worry too much about Tiger's board development, because until no one drops things of their own and put, uh, develops their own board, Tiger is going to have a hard time doing so. So there's the three in a row ramp. War Machine, War Machine, War Bond. Still left a lot of credits on the board here. Wasn't the most efficient ultimately, though. Look what's happening. Uh, he's going to be playing with nine credits to Tiger currently navigating a five credit pocket here. But ultimately, what is the follow up here? It's got, I mean, you have options here. Uh, the fifth can probably clear up the front line. You can actually drop a Yaka as well. Like, there's so many different ways that you can approach this. I think Noah taking full advantage of a fairly slow start by Tiger and just ramping his way to, um, you know, getting to all those big turns <laughs> sooner. Look at this, Tiger being forced to use their removal pieces on their own units because there's just no other way to cast them and help you sort of develop your hand this this big hand you have it's just sitting there and it's really it's quite depressing when you have to cast red dawn on your own units finally a piece on the board here and both players have honestly done the work to each other which is funny like most of the damage here has actually been self-inflicted and knowing now with a four five in the air and uh that is a pretty hefty thing to deal with the third 34th guard coming out at a, a hefty discount I, I just feel like, you know, with these fifth rangers, you're going to better move these up to the front line. And then 8 8 in the front line is not something Tiger is going to better handle very effectively. And they are going to have to trade at least one of these units away. You can do Red Dawn in the trade, but it's just such a scary prospect for Tiger that I think getting these fifth rangers up into the front line as an 8 8 might just be something which crushes Tiger's tempo advantage that they've gotten from dropping these 6 6s. Now, going for the. Going for the 8-8 still, but keeping it back. 
which is all right. I see what you're saying there. You could have actually just pushed them to the front here, but I think establishing a guard as well, you can always just trade with the 8-8 eight eight on your turn to clear the front line, but it's such an inefficient move. However, no one does have the advantage of having ramped four credits ahead of his opponent here. So the four credits that you're operating the that unit with well it's basically that's the that's the return on investment that you had with those three turns of ramp here however at the moment there tiger just establishing more on the board and a red dawn dealing three damage to one of the ground units means that this is not going to be a two for one trade with the eight eight it's actually going to only get one but uh, ultimately that might be just what you need at the moment here I think it's just still worth it to go for. And credit-wise, it actually turns out to be the same in hindsight because, you know, you can spend four moving it to the front line or you could spend four trading with it. You don't really actually lose anything. So it's quite an interesting idea just to keep it back and say, I'll spend those credits in the future instead of on this turn. We can see this 39th come down at some point and take one of these uh, guards away from Tiger. You may want to wait for it to become a little bit more developed first. You may just decide that actually I want this now and to take away as many options as possible from Tiger. So we see now Tiger having a very small hand. It's going to need something like a five-year plan to sort of dig their way out of this. You can sustain a five-year plan with this... Um, with the uh, man ostrom sorry and then you do find a way of cooling back into the game sort of ending the game with ura and doing big damage like that all right we'll see the marin ostrom is going to probably connect with we're going to say all right and does it get the job done yes look at that finally a behaving katusha with the benefit of a marin ostrom as well which is going to give uh, give tiger a little bit of extra health here a little cushion if necessary and all the infantry in no one's back line is basically glued there for now because a six six a six six occupies the front line but uh oh uh oh but the b17 into the euro factories could just be game that gives you a pershing or a b17f which is untargetable by orders both of which could just end the game on the spot Looks like he's just going to take the safe route here. A 5-5 five, five bomber is also well, pretty damn good, let's be real. Both, but Both of these have blitz, so you don't need it this turn. What you can do next turn, hit face for 5, go for the yield, and there you go. Able to finally secure themselves the win with this Soviet ramp deck. And it's going to be one of these situations now where can Tiger, you know, find this third game that they need with this Soviet deck or can no and make this a 3-2? We did see it yesterday, and I'm curious if we can see it again. Tiger still needs to convert with the Soviet list known now down to two options fighting for his life. It's not going to be a sweep, friends. No one's, you know, got to day two for good reason. That One of the best players in the world playing some of the best decks in the world as we once again lean on that uh, Soviet list as Tiger's got one more or two more kicks at the can potentially to actually convert here. But no one leaning now on a Japanese aggression list. How is he going to... Will he have what it takes? How fast do you have to be in this matchup? Is this a is this a situation bubbles where if you don't get the, if you're not winning on turn four, it's basically almost game over. I and mean, it, it certainly can be. There are actually some back and forth to this, um, a little bit more than people might realize at first because of the Italy ally for Tiger. It really changes the dynamic of this whole matchup. On the one hand, if no one is able to get a faint retreat off, then no one can just continue to flood the board and out-resource Tiger. But on the other hand, if Tiger gets a large unit with count uh, with the Man Ostrom on it, no one might really, really struggle to deal with that. No one's been just tossing out these dudes onto the board and they go right to the front line only to be met by the bloody sickle each time. No one actually perhaps had a, you know argument to wait a turn to drop uh, that with the panzer at the same time and occupy the front line with both units. But at the moment here, I think the, the mission is just to leave some bodies on the board. But two of the bloody sickles are gone now. And those are very efficient ways to deal with the, uh, the aggression of Japanese aggro here. But a 1-3 uh, fighter in the back line is it this a 6-6 six, six is going to join the board this game you can go for the red dawn and it gets the cost of these 34th down to one and if this 6-6 six, six gets into the front line this could cause major problems for neon to deal with but it's well, then uh, dice i mean so you that's what, this what, go, though? Uh, this maybe is... you don't maybe you hold back a little bit play a little bit slower you know try and let tiger use a man nostrum or a counter offensive something to buff it up a little bit if you drop it this turn there's a really high chance that it'll just get redawned and die on the spot so 
a 6-6 six, six is great. And like we mentioned, it is going to be difficult to deal with if it gets to the front line. But a three-pack of units are going to occupy there. And there's no fury. There's no easy way to deal with uh, that entire board the right now. The Winter Warfare in hand could be a very effective way, though. If you drop this guard and then go for the Winter Warfare, it is a little bit scary to drop this, burn your own HQ a little bit, and you know now you know you don't have it for the future. But I think it's worth it to drop it on the two units here. If uh, if no one here is stuck with something that doesn't have Blitz, which, again, it's uh, very odd to, to consider that that's the possibility. If he can throw that 6-3 into the front line, it might not be the easiest way to punch through, but um, the Signal Regiment would really help out here in order to just go ahead, and then you could just start, you know, yeeting dudes uh, into, uh, into the grinder in order to just get the job done through that kind of attrition, but... This is a, a nasty thing for no one to deal with now. He does have a 4-4 with Ambush and Fury, but it is met with a guard. So it's going to deal. It's gonna have to punch through that first before it starts connecting for damage. We may see a Winter Warfare come out as well. It's a, it's a very interesting dynamic if you went to Warfare where the Sheedan has free HP and your guard has free attack. Um, it does offer you, make you more vulnerable to later board clears, you know, if you don't have these Winter Warfares left, but it does mean that this Sheedan can't actually trade through your guard. Very expensive to operate as well. There's always a consideration, well, you just send a regiment and then you get a free roll into the, uh, into the HQ, but it's so expensive to deal with. And I think he's just going to go ahead and clear out the guard it first. It does threaten lethal though. You know, now Tiger has to find a way to deal with this. They, oh, the Man Ostrom. You can put Man Ostrom on the OT-34, and you can hit face for 8 damage and heal yourself up for 8 as well. <laughs> Look at this OT-34 doing its double damage to the HQ and just switching the health. Oh my wow. lord. I think that might be it. I, I think no one might struggle to deal with this. Yes, you can send die it, but with the with the six six in the front line, you're gonna have to send die and then you're gonna have to go for the trade. You cannot rely on the Akita Hyro here. You have to send die the OT thirty four and trade away your Shidon. And this man Ostrom off the top just changing the pace of the game instantly and swinging it massively in Tiger's favor. And you know what? It's not just the fact that the Mare Nostrum and the, the bonus damage to the HQ, it's the fact that it basically comes back to as your own HQ defense. The huge doubling down on the swing is huge. The only option you have here is Oh, the he's going for the high roll! Oh, he got the high roll! Incredible. No is, Incredible. I, I'm calling it now. This this man is a psychopath. Only a psychopath would go for that high roll. That is... Oh my lord. Well, there's a there's an old adage in card gaming. It's are you playing to win or are you playing to not lose? In that case, no one is playing to win, and that's the way that you have to come back into this matchup here. Perhaps you know, it, just playing to equalize the board or playing it safe is not necessarily going to grant you much of an advantage. You have to find a way to actually turn the tide, which he's doing here. He's clinging to five health here on that HQ. Doesn't have many options, but oh boy. Uh, so here comes back. Uh, yep. <laughs> It's just... I mean, you can Akita to the front line, you can meet her to the front line. There spawns in the beef wagon into the front line. And in theory, you're relatively safe. The big problem is we see this Ura in Tiger's hand and you drop this Ura, you hit the front line and you just end the game on the spot. These OT-34s, OT-34s doing double damage to the infantry of the Ura are going to do so much splash damage to the HQ that I really don't see any way in which no one can find a way out of this situation. What a change of pace. Uh, that Mary Nostrum changing everything. Also worth noting, that Mary Nostrum, I believe, is the only Italian card in that list. Am I right? I believe it's only a three-pack of Mary Nostrums in that entire list. That's it for uh, for Italian ally um, cont uh, contributions to that particular that particular effort. Otherwise, it's all Soviet. I, I appear to have scared to produce a team when I brought up psychopaths. It's it's something which they have a little bit of uh, trauma. For since uh, since yesterday's live stream, they seem to have been a little bit that. spooked. No, no, we we don't talk about that. We talk about <laughs> what's going on right now, which is uh, a perfectly sane and awesome thing. Uh, in fact, this is the Lloyd Braun of uh, of of games here. Perfectly sane, knows exactly what they're and doing. That's but... that's game right here, right? You go for the you go for the Ura, you hit this Akita, and the splash damage 
that's that's uh 12 damage and then splash damage 11 damage to the hq and taiki able to take the free one against no and five and rather decisively and yeah i i think tiger just played that game clean they played it smooth and they were really really able to deal with no one's soviet ramp deck which a lot of players can struggle to handle that was a very strong performance by tiger and i think they have definitely earned their spot in the finals based on the series of games that they have just played defeating no one five and defeating the first seed head in this event so far i gotta say um if we're thanking the Italians for anything, Chris, I think it's uh, it's it's good pasta and Mare Nostrum. I think that that is basically what we need to think about right now is the fact that that has been the greatest uh, contribution, at least uh, to my day, uh, has been Mare Nostrum and the pasta I'm going to eat later. I, uh, I'm going to call my nonna and I'm going to thank her for one of those two things. I won't say which one, but one <laughs> of the two I will definitely call her to thank her for. Eh, que cosa, que es eh, Mare Nostrum, que es... <laughs> Thank you, Nunna. Your people have provided the best moments of this cards event. Speaking of this cards event, let's take a look at the bracket and watch our... Wait, okay, the bracket's not quite ready yet. Uh, there goes my segue into something less weird. Unfortunately, we'll just have to talk about cards a little bit more there. Um, so, you know, we've... This isn't... I don't want to say anything bad against Berto Burrito because I think he's uh, a phenomenal player and a great dude. But looking at the bracket when we get it in a moment, the comparing the top to the bottom here, we're going to have Berto in the finals. We're going to have Tiger in the finals. We've had Berto defeat Uwu Moy. Uh, we've seen Berto defeat Jin Lun. Um, there you have it, 3-0, 3-1. But then you see Tiger defeating Head and Tiger defeating Noen to get to that finals. I mean, Bubbles... the. Head and no one could have both been favorites coming in to this event, even seeing, you know, no one defeat Jaking in the first round. I mean, I think this is one of those events where there's a case to be made for absolutely everyone. And there's no one where you, know, you don't look at any single player here and think this person isn't capable of winning the event. I think if I had to go into it betting on the first day, I think I would have gone for either no one or Jaking. You know, whoever wins that series going on to win the whole event. Uh, but it's very, very interesting to see that actually Berto, you know, pushing through really, really strong and Tiger as well, pushing through really, really strong. And these players do have fairly similar decks, both players opting to bring a self damage deck, which historically has been very good against USA frontline. It was pushed out post nerf, but again, very good against this USA frontline deck in general. And this might be something like why these players have brought it. And it's turned out to just, you know, fit into the meta really, really well and be really quite good against the other decks everyone else has brought. Who knows, it was an aspect of maybe not bringing the traditional four decks that we have seen at every OCC thus far this year. Thank you, Bubbles. Thank you, Flake. We have got the third place match come up in just a moment. A minimum of $250 on the line for everybody competing today. So uh, not not a bad little uh, brief briefcase full of cold hard cash is going to get slapped down on the table here for that third place match. Stay tuned. We've got that coming up in just under 10 minutes.
Welcome back, everybody. It is time for the third place match, the bronze match for the first ever OCC Ultimate Spoo's Darkness. We are going to get right into things because the winner of this match is taking home 500 USD. Fourth place gets 250 bucks, so not a bad prize, but nonetheless, that extra 250 is uh, going to feel pretty darn good. Um, folks, don't forget, not too long after this matchup, before the finals, we're going to have a little uh, chat with Elin, uh, going to tell us a little bit more about what to expect for Cards Esports in the back half of the year. Uh, but before we get into this bronze match, we want to give uh, no one a second to, to come down from that stress of the second semifinals. Um, Spooge, just curious any thoughts on that matchup between uh tiger and noen uh it will be an exciting one for sure it's the first time both players just face in an official an official cards tournament so it will be the first time for for both of them and yeah the, the difference between the price money 250 and 500 dollars is really really worth just fighting for that for winning that bronze match for sure Darkness, if you're knowing and you're coming out of that semifinals, you just took a loss. Does it does it take a second to get your head on straight and go, okay, I'm getting into another matchup here. I've got a kind of clean slate, start from scratch. Yeah, I think it's very important to to get that break, to to shake the tension off, to to regain some focus. Because People, even cards top players, are just humans, and it's not possible to stay focused for a very long time. At some points, you're going to 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 make mistakes. Um, very good example is the World Championship in the control meta, where 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 matches went on for more than one hour. Um, it's it's really really important to get this little break to to catch some some fresh air to drink some water to to relax a little bit before uh, being ready to to get back into the matches to be able to to have this focus you very you you need um, at this point fails or mistakes are unacceptable because even the smallest mistake can can lead to a loss and a loss right now means uh, a loss of 250 bucks so this is quite important for those players and let's also not forget the fact that time zones exist right you have somebody like Berto burrito going into the finals and it's you know not even noon in north america right now uh, on the european side we're getting late into the afternoon and then we have folks on the other side of the world and it's a it's a sunday night and they're playing long intense games so there's absolutely an aspect of that that mental game to take into it Let's uh, let's take a look at the decks one more time. I know we've seen uh, no wins a few times, so we'll just go for a quick little pass over here. Um, Spooz, why don't you walk us through exactly what no one is bringing in this best of five with one ban? Yeah, no one compared to other um, tournaments, more with a standard meta lineup here this time with the US German frontline deck that was very successful in the past days. And yeah, Brit Air being even more successful, still a very good deck, even after several nerfs, a deck that is still one of the best in the game. So just imagine how how strong it was months ago where all these nerfs have not happened yet. And third one, still another very, very prominent deck in the game, Japan, German, Jagro. And yeah, third, uh, fourth deck, kind of a known homebrew deck. Soviet um, USA ramp control with all those war machines, war burns. Not really popping off so far, but it had some good matchups. Once it, you get the, the ramp train rolling and can deploy your expensive stuff, steal your opponent's stuff with partisans, it can be quite good. But it struggles against aggressive decks since there's not a lot of healing. And yeah, also against... For example, discard stuff from Jin Lun. It's not too good because, yeah, there's not a lot of drawing in this deck. So kind of weaknesses, um, I'm pretty sure no one, if he would have the chance to decide it again, he would pick another deck, maybe self-damage, because I think this deck has a little bit too many weaknesses and might be the reason why he's not finishing 30 today, but 4th. 
We've seen no one bring this list a few times as well, and I feel like it's always had some some mixed results. So we'll have to see how this plays into our third place, our bronze matchup here. Let's take a peek at Jinlin's Dex Darkness. Why don't you give us a quick overview of what's going on here? With pleasure. Jinlan is bringing the famous US frontline deck, very straightforward, very aggressive deck. You go into the front line, you capitalize on that, and you want to overwhelm your opponent. As uh, a J aggro list is exactly that, like that, straightforward. The third deck, it's more conservative. It's control, almost heavy control. Soviet with Franks. Uh, this should be quite strong against aggressive decks. This could struggle a lot against the ramp deck from 9 5. And the fourth deck is Brit. Brit control with discard. I think this deck should be quite decent against aggressive decks like uh, like the three of no and five could um, struggle against the the ramp deck, but I don't think actually it will because of the amount of discard. So I'm expecting this one to be the strongest deck from Jin Lun here against the. Uh, lineup from No and Five, and I expect the Brit Air deck the strongest from No and Five. So, ABB always ban Brit is my suggestion here. Spoos? Yeah, that's what I want to say. I completely agree. Both Brit's decks be, being really annoying to deal with for the opponent. Um, no one's Soviet deck not really having a lot of amount of draw and the Brit Air deck is just yeah still the best deck in the game so yeah just go for the double Brit ban and then you both players are good to go. Let's bring him up and find out if that is exactly what is happening here if we're going Brit on both sides. Survey says Bing. yep. So always ban Brit once again coming out on top. We're not going to see the discard deck. We're not going to see the Brit Air list. Um, and then we've got, you know, the frontline list. We're going to see no one's going to have to pull out a victory with that Soviet list as well. Um, that could be a little bit challenging because it has not performed the best. You know, Darkness, I feel like we've seen no one bring uh, this list a few times and it hasn't always been a top performer. Uh, indeed. The, this control deck has not been a top performer. But in this scenario, it really depends on the matchup. You see, if Jin Lun is able to play the control Soviet version against the aggro from, from J aggro or from, from frontline, Jin Lun should have the upper hand. Of course, it's not guaranteed. Uh, it really depends on the start. Maybe 9-5 will be able to overwhelm him with pure force. But the worst that could happen for Jin Lan is to play his slow control deck against the ramp version of 9-5. This is where 9-5 is able to, to have the advantage deck-wise. And 9-5 really wants to get this scenario because running against those aggressive lines could backfire really hard and we saw this in in his previous match where he was not able to find his tools not able to get fast enough into the match and struggling with his soviet version so it's it's really like paper scissors rock who who is starting first with rich with uh, with rich deck and who's getting his favorite matchup uh, this this mental game before the start, this will be the, the main thing to, to look for. Who's able to read his opponent or who's able to overread it and fail in that regard. We, we need to see. We need to see the matchup and, of course, the performance. Do you, so, Spooz, you know, if you're, if you're looking at this and you're trying to figure out, hey, where do I start? If you're knowing and you're really looking for that control versus control matchup, do you assume that, hey, Jinlin's probably coming into this with something maybe more aggressive to start off the series? I'm going to go ahead and, you know, try and win something quick with Jagro. Or do you risk missing that control matchup if you don't lead off with it, if you're known five? Well, it's really hard to say. It's, I think you just always 
want to pick what you are comfortable with and the deck that you think has the best chances against all three remaining decks from the opponent and then you just go from there on i think you cannot really get into your opponent's head and and just think what it, might he pick first so yeah i think you just pick your best deck and then just proceed from there on so you get comfortable getting into the match and then yeah it's but we, control, look what we have the, Soviet wow. mirror the control mirror here this is perfect this is a perfect start from Noyan five but it's not guaranteed. I mean, it looks pretty good with the War Machine and War Bonds for 9-5. And, and really he's going good. second, so he's able to have more, more cards, more options, and more ramp. Yeah, he has War Machine, he has the fifth Ranger, so he can already deploy on turn three then, plus followed up by War Bonds on turn four. And all that Jinlan has here is the Padliakov that is pretty good against the fifth Rangers. The Petliakov will disable the deployment effect of the fifth rangers, and the US research is able to to give him a little bit of counter ramp if he really wants to. So actually not that bad of a start for Jin Lan here. Uh, he's going straight forward, killing the uh, the Chaika. And I'm just going to ramp here, right? Going to ramp, just going for the war bonds here. And Jinlon starting with the second Rima. Now two units here have Ooh. mobilize effect. What is pretty strong uh, for gaining value over time, but knowing five is at eight credits right here. And, and he found he has... the Euro factory. So there is a potential later to just steal the Pedliakov whenever needed. And yeah, just kill it and make him no one's unit with playing Euro factories on it. I'm not sure if he's there is there's the need to go for it now since he has a Yak and also an Ishak on board. But I think it's just too good because you are at eight credits. That means whenever you want to, you can utilize your fifth Rangers as an eight eight now. And he got the T the tank out of it. Very strong. Ooh, T60, very strong, yeah. No, now he has four T60s on Battlefield and in his deck. What gives him quite a lot of big threats for later in this match. Let me check uh, if there is a possibility. Rima, second Rima has five credits, so he could have stole it with Partisans and upgrade this as well. But an 8-8 eight, eight in the front line here with only six cards in hand, so that Defender Death is not able to kill that unit. Maybe they could also trade in the Briansk Regulars maybe, but yes, Regulars for... would have been a oh, good he's advancing. He's advancing to the to the nukes maybe. Navy the guard. On... All this is a ghost. powerful tool to be able to trade. And this Amorot train is getting really big here. The both players with partisans in their hand now. Not really able to utilize it right now since Jin Lan is only at 7 credits. So he could have stolen that 5th Rangers, but yeah. Uh, could have not operated not... with the full operation cost. Yeah, he can't operate and he can't upgrade either with Red Banner or Evil Factory. No, and 5 on the other side could steal the Amorot train and upgrade it with Red Banner to get another unit. Probably not necessary right now because Amorot train can't attack. And just killing the second Reamer, getting rid of the mobilization effect. Great. The plane attacked into the Amorot train, but did not die. Ah, okay, because of the buff from We Can Do It. So the fighter got buffed and then back to 1 HP again. Naval Brigade will kill the 5th Ranger and Jinlan is advancing into the front. Not 
a lot of pressure with those small units. 9.5 still has a ton of options here. So I just found that Jinlon is not playing Euro Factories or Red Banner. Oh, Red Banner is in the deck. Okay, so only Red Banner. So the Partisans, if he ever is playing it, he needs to yeah just trade one for one with it, or just as a as a, an emergency solution to just send a unit back to the hand. Yeah, but if you trade so, with the first rifles or the Yak Nine, I believe it is, um, you're getting the destruction effect. Even the T60 could be worse. Like stealing the unit, trading efficiently, getting the destruction effect. But the research, going for the nukes, going for the board clear and the damage, this looks really promising to me and a good opportunity to, um, yeah, to, to just execute, going for the Manhattan nukes to be able to clear the board and threaten the HQ. Yeah, especially because known stack is only having the engineer battalions that he did not find by now, and two we can do it for healing. So 12 damage from the nukes, plus the additional board clear, followed up by maybe tractor factories. It could be pretty scary for known. Oh, that well, was a mistake. So we can do it buffed the, the T60 and the first rifles to be above 6 HP, so they won't die to the first nuke, only to the second nuke. Um, which makes it a little bit easier for 9.5 to deal with those, but still, there are the Man Manhattan projects. Jinlun is starting to grind down this first rifle, it looks like. Yeah, Jinlan's hand really awkward here. A lot of orders, but you cannot really get any good value out of them right now. Not any good partisans target, because units, uh, no one's units have so much health. So the only option was to advance to the nukes there. But as you said, two of the three units on board are still surviving this. Plus, no one sitting on, yeah, almost comfortable 25 health here, I think. Yeah, but, but on the other hand, no one's hand is also not looking too great, right? Yeah, Two no one's hand is not looking too great here. Uh, he's going for the stars and stripes to clear the units out, even attacking with the T60 and ramping a little bit more. I think it's still very good for Jin, Lim, uh, for Jin Lan. He was able to use a lot of credits to go for this research Relatively unpunished, 95 only took advantage by 3 damage into the HQ. So now one uh, Manhattan project with defend and depth will clear the board. Or not, he's going for the KV-1 instead. Could have attacked into the HQ first with the fighter. He missed two damage by this play. But with having the KV-1 on the field, he's of course threatening 9-5 and forcing him to use the Partisans plus upgrade here. Maybe the UL factories to keep the banner for the... For the uh, 72nd, yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, he's oh. using the red banners already. Very big unit. I think this was a 50% chance, right? To get another 270 second? Yeah, I think there are yeah, two 8 get... credit options, yeah. There are two 8 credit options. It's this and that would have been great team. against the nukes, right? Because if the 270 second died, you still would have had a Euler Stalin on board. Now Jinlan is able to clear the board here, I think followed up by a Winter Warfare, I guess. Maybe it's not necessary to play Winter Warfare. Well, he's still going for it. Winter yeah, Warfare is 13, in... right? I mean, sure, he has two call to the colonies, but I think he's very likely going to use them for the draw part. Yeah, I guess he needs a draw. Uh, the reason why I would like to to see him keeping 
Winter Warfare is the ISU, but of course, uh, this T-34 is too dangerous, C would have killed it anyway, and then his HQ would have been exposed to a ton of damage from the surviving unit. So Winter Warfare was indeed the correct choice to be able to sustain his HQ a little bit. 9-5, finding the... 39th rifle regiment here, but there's no one or two credit unit to steal. Again, there any in the deck? I oh, am yeah. okay. Jinlan has a few, like Chaika, and they're also playing with no, I think he's not playing with engineer battalion, but Bransk regulars. Oh, no, he's playing with engineer battalion, so this would also be would also be a good target, probably. So there are targets at least, but not currently on the board or in the player's hand. Yeah, and Jinlan, I mean, those, this one nuke keeps no one away from just yeah, spamming unit after unit, so no one has to manage his resources pretty well here, because there's always a risk that one nuke is clearing his whole board. Card but... finding defend in depths, not just enough to kill the Amort train, but the spy ring will give him another research. This is the German, German nice. research, this could be really a U strong. Going, going for the U-boat, going to destroy a unit and discard two cards. This will be very painful for No End 5. He could also think about, since he's not having a lot of mass removal other than that Manhattan project, there's also a chance, since No One Hand is full anyways, that he can advance to the Urine project to kill all enemy units. Um, I think there are arguments for both. Like, sure, that U-Boat is pretty strong, destroy any unit, and just make your opponent discard two cards. We will see what, what route um, Jinlon is taking here. Oof. Not at 8 is. This is quite a lot of pressure from those rifles. Uh, and the T-34 in hand. I wish Nine. that I, I think that Jinlan would wish his winter warfare back here. Finding the ISU, exactly, a pretty decent board clear. Unfortunately, he needed it earlier, and now he needs to find ways to yeah get rid of this big eight eight fifth rangers in the front line. He can use the partisans, trade it into the armored train, send it back to no one's hand. I think that's his only option here. But yeah, it would just be like a boomerang. It will just come back next turn, I guess. Yeah, it's not a great use of partisans. 9-5 got back the fifth ranger and is able to, to operate with them. And the first rifle got destroyed also. It's second rifle now. There it comes. Again, back pretty big again. unit back in the front line. No and five having thirteen credits, so T thirty four is able to kill the guard, and eight eight is able to attack. But the thirty ninth rifle regiment is able to steal another guard. This looks very strong for Jindan. He can play that. Steal the Bram's Irregulars, very important placement to the left side, so the stolen unit will be on the right side guarding the HQ. And then he can advance with the German research to, to reach the, the U-boat stage. And with the remaining credit, killing the 1-1 one, one light infantry. Ah, uh, he's not going for the research, he's going for the trade. Interesting decision here. More safe, definitely, because 8-8 is a beast. Especially if your uh, HQ is down to 13. Heroes of the Soviet Union. 9-5, able to pick another Soviet elite card. And Soviet has a lot of strong elites. It's 272nd guards. 
and his own 39s is stealing back the Bryang's irregulars. Wait, this well, is why, why are they in the front line? <laughs> eh? Why did they go to the I front line and not to the support line of known? I can't really say. Uh, that, look, that looks strange, but yeah, not too much of an impact here, because yeah, there's not any fighters on Jinlon's side, so this thing being in the front line helped no one a little bit, because he saved one credit and Jinlon needs to take care of another unit in the front line, but that was strange behavior. Another partisans found from no one. Yeah, a really tough situation here for Noon, to be honest. The 272nd is a good find, because now we can maybe go a little bit wider and force out that second Manhattan project from Jinlan, because that just prevents him from playing stuff like tractor factories, for example, or just advancing another T-34 to the front line, because that nuke will just wipe out the whole board. This nuke, this Manhattan project is doing so much for Jinlan, not by using it, on an, uh, instead of scaring Noin 5 to, to build up a board to, to yeah, be effective and getting really into this match. Bloody Sickle finding the hammer. He can take out one unit here, Bryanks or the 5-5. Five five. I think 5-5 five five is way better. Yeah, I agree. And advancing with the T-34. Okay, he wants Not to have that additional face damage. Additional face damage. Okay, this now that forces comes Jinlan to go for the nukes. And maybe even heal. Call to the colony is being used to heal himself. Manhattan Project wiping the board. And he's able to advance into the front line. And now it's time for the tractor factories to arrive, probably. You can trade one unit away and still go face with the other one, because there's enough credits to do this. That would Alternatively, be... could be 272nd, maybe. Or the 5th Rangers. Or the oh. Partisans. Oh, the reason why no and 5 went for the... For, the, for killing the guard and attacking is this partisans because he's able to put a lot of pressure here. There comes the track a factory, factory. From Jinlan now. Can take out both units, but now. Oh, no one is just one credit short. Oh no, he's actually more credit short. Never mind. But he can still deal another five day face damage. And look, both, both are pinned from the <laughs> artillery effect. Bows are pinned. It's not looking great for Jin Lan here, actually. Tractor Factory coming in. One is advancing. Jin Lan down to four. Scorched Earth won't do enough here. Found the Reamer, so you can guard up at least. I think he has to go for Reamer. Yeah, Reamer has six health, right? So technically, it's just stopping both T-34s right now. Technically, no one... not that. I'm looking at this U-boat. U-boat is able to kill one unit, but the second tank will just kill Jin Lan. Also, he has pretty good chances of uh, ripping off the 272nd. But oh, wow. he's going he for just Rima gives no and Phony so much draw now. No one five is back. One in sickle cards. and one sickle and no one wins. And he just found nothing. Oh, that that naval brigade is also. Oh no, it's four operation costs now on the tanks. So. Only a sickle would have helped no one no, here finally. No, the B-17 has a 50% chance of killing the guard. Do you take 50% here? You could also just go KV-1 maybe. KV-1 is also a very good option. But then Jinlan is down to 2 and you also have nothing to deal to direct damage. Takes the 50 50 chance and got Hitting it. Hitting Rima and that's it. 9 5 taking the first victory. Got closer, got much closer than expected. But in the end, 9 5 was able to win with his ramp deck. 
and as expected but yeah as you said it, it was closer than than we thought but in the end just the value won over yeah that amount of healing and guards not really doing a lot there for Jinlan. like Jinlan was good in just keeping no one in check but yeah there was not really any good pressure from him and in the end yeah that just won known the game and as we said no one with the momentum now starting good into this matchup and now still having access to two very strong lists. I mean, Jin Lan with the Soviet deck, pretty good against the Jaguar list probably. But other than that, known with, with good amount of momentum here. Let's see if we if he can just continue with dominating this match so far. It's still pretty even, I think. Even uh, Jin Lan's control deck should be strong against those aggro decks. But even if Jin Lan is taking the win here, it's basically a mirror lineup. It's frontline and J Aggro against frontline and J Aggro. Yep. So let's see how Jindan is able to perform the second time with his Soviet deck. Ooh, and the 30 second bit, top deck. Oh. The 30 second top deck. A little bit unlucky here, but on the other side, Noin 5 was able to send the Red Devils into the frontline. Petliakov here, very important stopping deployments effect like 99's infantry regiment plus two plus two buff is not gonna happen half track retreat not gonna happen so this Petliakov is so crucial and so strong against frontline line 5 really needs to to consider the next moves here it's blitzkrieg Ooh. killing Petliakov. i mean that that makes absolute sense he has another copy left usually you don't want to have two copies of blitzkrieg in your hand anyways and that Petliakov is really really painful for known because any of his deployments effect would not happen so it was a good utilization of the blitzkrieg absolutely worth it it looked strange but yeah i think he had to do it like it, it was a great move yeah I'm, I'm calling it. I think it was absolutely great. Like a lot of players would just think, oh, the Blitzkrieg is so important later on. But you, I think you're losing the match if you don't do it here. That Padlyakov just trades out your whole board. The Chaika additionally. You cannot play half tracks and stuff like that. So yeah, that, that was oh. absolutely worthy of playing the, the Blitzkrieg then. I don't agree with this Rima play. Of course, it is strong. It is a guard. If Noin 5 does not have half track, could be very efficient. But Defendant Death could have killed the Red Devil. And Spy Rings could enable another uh, research here. Now, Noin 5 using the half track to send back five credits of value. What is, what is really strong? And really tempo spring for Noin 5. Rima is getting deployed again. He's starting to trade. Uh, luckily for Jin Lan, Noin 5 does not have the second half track. So soon he needs to trade into the guard. Very beneficial for Jin Lan here. Combat engineers will make this a little quicker. Uh, Rima is done and the board getting flooded. Noin 5 really sets the tone and the pressure. And just another guard from Jin Lan. So his deck is basically just half of the deck is guards, like all these Brian's Irregulars, Rima, and first rifles. It will be really hard to just get all or, or get through all these from Noin. I think he's not having 10 half tracks in the deck, so there's not too many good answers. Sure, one Blitzkrieg was also already played. Yeah, but there's a second Combat Engineers, and with the second Combat Engineers, every unit is getting buffed plus two damage. And there are a ton of cheap units for Noin 5. Right now, he is able to just send Rave after Rave into Jin Lan, into the front line, and after Jin Lan. It feels really close. Noin 5 looking for some better option. There's a Hellcat. Should be very useful later on if Jin Lan decides to play the KV. But for now, Jin uh, Noin 5 has the Sherman, another powerful body. And maybe sending the Greyhound into the front. No, choosing the second combat engineers. 
Uh, the Chocolate Boy is 4 1, a ton of damage. Nine five looks quite comfortable here. First rifles in Nazar Guard for Jinlan. It's it's a battle battle of material. So many units. I'm expecting even the Briangs Irregulars coming in. Yeah, and Rima to the front line, so no one gets is not I getting. I don't. I don't agree with that. So you don't get the the mobilization buff, or why? Yeah. Jinlan could have gotten two mobilization effects, the the power of the second Rima. Uh, now, of course, 9 5 is an, has to trade into it one for one, what is not that great. But the mobilization effect could be a little bit better in the, in the long run. Sure, and that also opens the possibility for Known to trade the 5th Rangers into that unit and advance the Sherman. So, yeah, in hindsight, maybe not the best idea to move up. Sure, against frontline, usually you want to fight for the frontline. But I think in this case, it might have been a slight mistake to miss out the mobilize effect. Plus, yeah, give your opponent a chance to trade an infantry unit into that one. Well, on the other side, taking the front line against the front line deck is very important. You oh, see, that dive bombing is kind of useless against that Briangs. Against Briangs Irregulars. <laughs> Having <laughs> Briangs Irregulars in the front line against Noin 5 right here is very, very strong for Jin Lan. Noin 5 has to commit the Hellcat, and if he decides to kill the Briangs Irregulars this turn, uh, the Hellcat will die and anything else he traded with. So it feels a little bit like check. And 9 5 is just damaging the bearings a, a little bit, sending more, more bodies here. I definitely agree with 9 5's turn, but by taking the frontline, Jinlan gave so much. Uh, took so much tempo huge. away. Partisans. Yeah, Partisans allows a very good trade with the Hellcat. Getting rid of two of those four tag units, plus two guards in the front line now, and no one's hand. Only full of one and two drops. And it's Panzer not... 35T, it's okay, that's not a good one. what you want to, to have. At least this has two attack and is able to get rid of the Briance Irregulars. But yeah, other than that, it's not really helpful. You still have to dive bombing for the T60. But and not by, really by, a way. Oh, you can by, with the 109. So he's able to clear the front line if he wants to. He's able to clear the front line indeed. But by playing the Sherman the turn before, 95 is unable to go for card draw and to... Uh, not even taking the front line and capitalizing on, on the front line effect. He did not trade the Panzer 35T into the Briangs Irregulars. That means he has to trade two units into the Briangs. And now losing Combat Engineers and Greyhound just to keep the Panzer 35T a little bit questionable too. But with I think he Panzer wanted to be in the front line to just deploy the 22nd and get additional draw, which otherwise he would have not been able to. But yeah, yeah that just opens a pretty strong Winter Warfare here now for Jin Lan. The Winter Warfare is very strong. And no one really has to hope that a 109th is... Okay. Oh, this is so awesome from Jin Lan. Just killing the unit in the front line and sending the 5-5 tank into the front line to prevent Noin 5 to get the Sherman draw. With Red Devils and Sherman, he would have been able to do so, but not with Jin Lan here. And now he has plenty of options. Yeah, finally Jin Lan also found some healing. So whenever he, he is in danger there, he can just heal himself back for 8 HP health. And he's also kind of dominating the front line there with no not having too many options to reconquer it. Also losing the Skytrain now. Yeah, everything is going for Jinlan right now. 
taking away the sky train, taking away the buff unit, so preventing No N5 from killing his unit and advancing advancing into the front line uh, to stop the Sherman draw and the comeback. Even if No N5 would draw more cards, now the KV1 is on the battlefield and No N5 will receive two damage every time. Jinlan very strong performance here against the frontline deck. And no one fire if, well, technically he's able to kill the unit in the front line, dive bombing and trade with the two units of the support line and Red Devil. But he's just plain dropping the Sherman. Yeah, I mean he needs stats on board. There was a way that he could have cleared a 5-5 in the front line with the dive bombing. But yeah, I think you don't win here if you just have a board full of one drops. So yeah, just an upper battle for no one here. And I'm, I'm not Definitely. even sure if he can fight anything here that, that brings him back to the game. 20, 20 seconds, seconds is not it. It, it is I think not Hellcat would have been a possibility to just give him a chance so, to kill that yeah. KV1. Heck, it yeah. could have made it a little bit easier, but now it's even. No As expected, was... that Soviet deck really yeah. doing work against aggressive list with all those guards and the potential healing and yeah, a lot of control tools. The partisans also swung the game around there for for no one losing two units with four attack. And yeah, now we have two, maybe two mirror matches coming up. It's frontline and J Agro against frontline and J Agro. And both well, players no going for J Agro. J Agro mirror matchup. Well, Noin Five is one of the player uh, who's every single month in the top. He's playing so much on ladder, and J Agro and frontline are typical ladder decks. So experience wise, Noin Five has the advantage here, but Jinlan proved themselves to be very capable of understanding those those matchups and lines. Panzer Befehlswagen top deck, so Calvary Regiment into the front line, being able to get the Panzer Befehlswagen here. Noin 5 has desperate measures, but this would be very desperate here. So yeah. Especially Arado because he has, a, he has a buddy on board, right, that can kill yeah. one of those frontline units. Not really worth just going back to two credits here for the next turn. So you can just take that one out. And yeah, I want to mention, not just experience-wise, no one is maybe having the slight advantage here. We've also seen Jinlan doing quite some mistakes today. So might not be in the best spot today. So maybe another thing that is going for no one here. But yeah, we will see how it's going. Jinlan at least is rocking that champion's card back, which is pretty nice. So, flexing point goes to him. <laughs> that is true. However, no one's five card back means he's level 500? No. 250, I guess. 250, yeah, sorry. Uh, so, this is something to break with also. Jinlan just dropping the Akita Regiment, going for the HQ. Nuen 5 after dropping Dina has a lot of potential units. The first signal regiment looks very promising. Maybe together with trading with Dina and Panzer 35T to kill the type and go into the front line. Could be a nice desperate line measures. here. Or desperate measures to really go for the tempo swing. Akita Regiment hit the front hit the HQ. And Noin 5 has some options. Hmm, I don't know if I agree with this desperate measure play. Killing three units. But it took away some momentum of Jin Lan, definitely. Yeah, that also delays no one's danger to read one more turn now. I mean, he's still having a full hand. Well, no, in five had yeah. way too much units, especially the first signal regiment. You don't want to rip them off. Yeah, for sure. 
it's definitely going to play this before Faint Retreat. I mean, you can probably lose everything, but you don't want to lose it that Signal Regiment with the Faint Indeed. Retreat. Indeed. And yeah, a lot of stuff to play around with um, that no one has in his hand. You can drop the Signal Regiment and then followed up by a 15 and a 35T just to get back into the front line. That's a lot of pressure. Um, I did not fully agree with 9.5's desperate measure move, but with the lack of good options, Jinlon wasn't able to, to set up the pressure. Last turn only using Wibblewind and trading a little bit was not that strong. And he's feels like he's crawling towards the turn 6 and uh, maybe playing Faint Retreat, but playing against the first signal regiment being down to 12 it, there's a lot of pressure on Jin Dan right here Ulvind advancing into the front line attacking again the HQ 9-5 can think about trading or going for full damage the trade it is it's to go for the trade he don't want to give Jin Lan any more draw but he didn't I think know it's that. Not, not about the draw uh, with his type 93, he could have traded one for one against Wibblewind. I think 95 wanted to prevent that. Jinlan now played the feigned retreat on curve, very strong move. 95 on the other side sets up the pressure, the key 83. This is one of the cases where playing feigned retreat on curve is maybe not the best idea. Here it is the pressure in my opinion. The 6-5 is such a strong body and Jinlan mm. is looking for something. And he found something. The he found something to pin it at least, yeah. Yeah, he has to pin it. Uh, he will survive another turn. Wait, what? No, don't do that, yeah. yeah. I'm confused. Um... Okay. That makes sense now, because Yukosuka goes to 3 attack. Can take out the Wibblewind now. That yeah, prevents so lethal. It, it was still a so, if you're no one here. Oh, wait. Shit in top deck. So, Shit I think you can't deck? go faint retreat any longer. You just wait for next turn. Try to kill two of your units right now, and then you just kill your opponent with the shit in next turn. I think that's the that's the plan for no one. this i would have loved to see wait what why did he not uh, he... attack with the dina first into it no he's by by using the dina he set the panzer Fieldswang into the front line there is almost no possibility for jinlan to be able to not kill any unit and pin everything see? now he's getting punished for not trading the dina into the type 94. He's one no, damage he's... off now. I mean, there's still a lot of things to do for, for Jinlan here to Jin actually is... not die, but... 9-5 is not getting not getting punished. Of Wait course, the first Wait. signal regiment is going to die, but Jinlan can't even handle the key 83 by now. Um, and he needs this type to find another type. This is over. 9-5 wins this battle. Jinlan can advance into the front line, but the key would have killed him anyway. I mean, I'm still not sure if this really was the best idea, because if you set him to 4, you have the shit in guarantee to kill him next turn. And if Jinlan found one pin card, one time T94, to pin that key 83, things could have gone differently. But yeah, in the end, it, it worked out for no one. And 2-1 now. He's only one win away from winning that bronze match and taking home $500. But I'm pretty sure Jin Lan wants to do his best to, yeah, take himself home that, that prize money. It's still far from over. Jin Lan will get another chance now against No. 5 frontline deck. And no one and going first. 9-5 going first, and he has a 32nd Infantry Regiment and Panzer 35T, oh, finding a second 32nd Again. Infantry Regiment. This hurts a little bit, denies him a little bit of options here, but the Cavalry Regiment by Jin 
Lan is able to take the front line. Very important step for Jin Lan. Now no in five. Probably has to trade and send another unit. Finding the, the last remaining 32nd infantry regiment. Jin Lan you, now using the bicycle regiment. Actually, this was a small mistake because this enables no in five to play the Panzer 35T gets an efficient trade by playing turn one the bicycle regiment and now the cavalry regiment. This would have prevented this move from 9 5 and would have gained a little bit more value here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's always a thin line between uh, what units you want to play first, but usually, yeah, you just want to go with the one attack unit first and just exactly prevent what happened now that a 35t is getting the value trade surviving this the attack and yeah just going to the front line and now you suddenly have to take care of two of them enabling jin lan to play the arado here found the desperate measures not really the spot where you want to play it now it's very hard to tell what jin lan wants to do now wait what i do disagree with desperate measures a lot type playing that both tanks would have been stronger because losing this credit slot this early against no and five who's already went first and has the advantage is a very desperate move and i don't think jinlan is that desperate right uh, is yet in uh, that early in the game However, it enabled Jinlan to take the front line with uh, the one credit infantry and the Panzer 35T, setting up some pressure, very important still for Jinlan here, to be able to chip away the, the HP of the HQ. However, Noen 5 has a lot of units to drop. Yeah, another downside of the desperate measures um, is that Known 5 can now just go wide with the 32nd, for example, and establish a big support line. And there's not much that Jinlan can do against this. If he would have kept that desperate measures, then Known must a little bit, uh, care a little bit more about it. And yeah. I'm, I'm thinking what Known might do here. It's just go fifth rangers and play dive bombing on the Yokosuka or... Dive bombing trade and dropping three infantry units i think this is a play just uh, yeah after desperate measures is out he can just yeah, plot the board nothing to what fear. he's able to do now and that might be a problem for jinlan because yeah you can deal with some units especially with akita regiment but some of those might go to, go to the front line and then your opponent is playing a sherman and getting an insane amount of draw plus a 4-4 body on board very important play for Jinlan. Sending Arado into the front line, this unit will get the trade anyway because Noen's five line support line is full. But getting the extra draw from 22nd Infantry Regiment is very important. Jinlan needs more options, more opportunities right here. Sendai Regiment looks not that strong by now, but he will get another draw next turn. So this looks actually a little bit better for Jin Laun from compared to one turn ago. However, Noen 5 gets the Sherman draw. He finds Hellcat, he finds Blitzkrieg, he even got Skytrain from his own 22nd Infantry Regiment, what makes his turn so much more valuable uh, compared to Jinlan's state right here. There are not a lot of great options for Jinlan. One option is definitely surprise attack, killing that big tank. Now going for the Akita Regiment. Akita Regiment it hits. Uh, wasn't able to get a clean uh, entire bot wipe here. What is really not that great for Jin Lan. Akita Regiment finding the other trade would have been much better. Oh, and now, now Jin Lan really in a tough spot here. Like Befehlswagen not having Blitz. Raiding Brigade was probably one of the better top decks, able to get rid of the Skytrain. And together with the Type 94, also able to get rid of the 22nd in the front line. 
Was so that really was strong. that was really helpful, but really still helpful, yeah. really not the best situation. Jinlan desperately needs the faint retreat now to refill his hand. That sender regiment is yeah, is good against big units, but no one is having a lot of stuff in hand now, and also and the no blitzkrieg. He's just setting up. Look at that combat engineers. He can send two infantry, even with Red Devils, three infantry units into the front line. Maybe even dropping the Hellcat behind, setting up a big Blitzkrieg to play next turn. Now he's just going for, for the trade, actually, killing this little type. Oh, Akita Regiment, Akita, another, another good very, top deck. very, very good top deck. And Not going Sendai face Regiment. this time. Then I would... Sandai Regiment or Befehlswagen? I'm... And sure, Moment 5, realizing that was a mistake, he could have uh, set up with the Red Devils a lot more pressure here. Panzerfeldswagen not doing a lot right here, but this is another trade opportunity for Jin Lan. And no one just wants to get the stats on board and in the front line. He's setting up that big, big Blitzkrieg, and I don't see a lot of options here for no one to stop this this blitzkrieg on three units should be good enough to close out the game that's five plus eight 13 actually it's not it's one off no no it's no no there's the 109 that's exactly lethal it's ex exactly it's three five 15. six plus nine it's 15 uh, exactly exactly plus one exactly plus one nine <laughs> five played very well here and is guaranteeing himself the third place in Plus this front $500. Match. That's $500. No, in five, just won 500 bucks. Of course, congratulations to Jin Lan, uh, scoring fourth and winning 250 bucks. Not too shabby. Yeah, it was still a great opportunity at least to get some some bucks and experience in this first OCC uh, Ultimate. And it is the first OCC Ultimate. It's great to be here. Absolutely. It was a phenomenal matchup there. Um, we, we talked a little bit going into the game about how no one was hoping for that mirror matchup with the control list. It wasn't a given, but I feel like that win definitely helped no one carry that momentum throughout the series. Darkness, you're, you're nodding your head. Do you think that that was kind of what set the tone there? He got maybe his potentially weakest deck through, and after that, it was kind of smooth sailing from there? Yeah, definitely. I think... Uh, if Jinlon would have been able to uh, to play his his aggressive decks first and maybe winning first with them and after that finishing with his control deck against one of the the control uh, one of the faster decks from No and Five, that could have made the difference. But with No and Five, his Achilles first. The, the ramp deck winning against the slower control deck, not losing any momentum against the aggressive matchup. Like I said, uh, just mentally, it's paper, rock, scissors. 9 5 was able to get a very good matchup in the first encounter and was able to continue on, on this power line. So. And of course, not uh, of course to mention, Noyan Five was able to play very, very strong, not making mistakes, almost flawless. While Jinlan made some questionable moves. Of course, you can't, you cannot see your opponent's hand, and sometimes you think this could be beneficial, more beneficial to uh, to score the victory. But in the end, uh, it it was not, and Noyan Five was able to. Uh, to seal the deal. Do you think that's part of it, Spooz? Do you think the fact that no one has been in OCC after OCC in a top performer just maybe honed skills a little bit more, less mistakes, Jinlin, a little bit less experienced and, and maybe maybe some nerves, maybe a bit tired, long day, things like that that can play into it? Yeah, I mean, it absolutely makes a difference. If you are not motivated or not in a good mental spot, um, 
if you just, I don't know, if you're tired and you just want to get the matches as fast as possible behind you, there is a big chance you're just missing important things or doing questionable plays and then playing against an opponent who's not doing that and just always playing optimal, then yeah, you just give yourself, if you if you imagine that you usually, if you just assume both players are on an equal level, you have a 50% ch chance of winning. But if the other one is in a, in a really, really good spot and the other one is not, then you're just shifting the odds and yeah then it's very more likely that you're losing than if you would both be on a same mental level. Absolutely. Let's uh, let's bring up the bracket and let's see where we're at right before we get into our uh, our finals here. So there you see the path that the players have taken. No one five defeating Jinlin in the bronze matchup, taking home five hundred dollars. Jinlin taking home two fifty. We're gonna have Tiger versus Birdo Burrito, our grand finals of the first ever OCC Ultimate in just a couple moments. Winner taking home not only the title of the first ever winner, but also one thousand dollars. Before we get there, though. Uh, we've got a little little special feature for you. I am going to be joined by Eileen uh, to talk a little bit about the OCC and actually Cards Esports in general in the back half of the year. There you are, Eileen. How, uh, how excited are you to have experienced this first ever OCC Ultimate? I feel like it hasn't let us down. Absolutely. It's been it's been so amazing. And I feel like, you know, just I just want to say a huge congratulations to to every single player that uh, qualified that we've seen playing here throughout this weekend. These are the most skilled and dedicated players that we have in cards in the world right now. Um, and it's been amazing to watch them all play. And I am so pumped to see um, how this how the grand finals is going to go and if it's going to be bird or tiger who earns this first uh crown of the occ ultimate uh, champion absolutely so you've got some you've got some news for us i understand around cards esports some little, little changes and tweaks excellent yes so um so I feel like right now is a good time to be talking about this because we're sort of reaching the end of the first sort of new cycle with this OCC Clash, the OCC Ultimate. Um, and, you know, the beginning of the year, we introduced, you know, kind of a number of changes um, to esports. And uh, I feel like over the course of the last uh, months, we've learned a lot from what we've been doing. And we've been doing a lot of evaluating of where our esports is currently at, uh, our resources, the allocations and stuff like that. And so we want to make some little tweaks uh, and uh, and see where that will take us. So we'll be shifting our focus just a little bit for the kind of latter half of the year. Uh, we're going to be focusing mainly on what is sort of our flagship tournament, which is the OCC. Um, and so there's going to be kind of two main changes happening to the OCC Clash. Uh, we are going to be moving those to a live broadcast format. Um, and we're going to introduce to those as well a 500 USD prize pool as well. So uh, so some, 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 some little um, tweaks uh, to that there. Um, and uh, we'll have, uh, so one more each of the uh, special operations and cards open tournaments uh, coming up uh, now in uh, in May and, and June. Um, but after that, we're kind of going to take a little bit of a pause from those formats for the latter half of the year um, and really focus on honing the OCC experience. Um, and also we're focusing on uh, community tournaments. We're looking for all kinds of ways to increase our support uh, in those. Now we have an excellent community that already we have various kind of community tournaments which we want to continue to support and also encourage more players to run their own tournaments um so you know depending on the tournament we might be able to offer assistance with things such as uh, in-game prizes temporary access to spectator mode so you can broadcast your tournament similarly to to what we do here um and some giveaway codes for uh, for viewers uh, on the stream uh so so there's a there's a lot of opportunities there um and i really encourage people to check out the cards contributor program program um, or just reach out to me directly on discord i'd love to hear from you if you're interested in uh, in setting up your very own community tournament um, so check out our latest dev blog which has just come out you can check out the news section on cards.com or check out uh, steam uh, to get more details uh, about this esports update and of course we'll have at the end of the year the world championship i don't have any announcements to make in that regard but we're extremely hyped about it um, and we're getting uh, we're getting ready to set that all up for you so incredibly exciting stuff 
Amazing. So let me let me break it down just a little bit because you just dumped a whole lot of information on us there. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so OCC Clash, they're going back to live. I imagine that's going to be in sort of the traditional format we've seen the OCCs be in in the past. So kind of a one day event um, going through the, the bracket. Absolutely, exactly. Perfect. And then we're adding a $500 prize pool to those events. Now that is not going to affect the OCC ultimate prize pool, right? No, the OCC ultimate prize pool is staying the same. Um, and, and you can basically expect the same thing uh, from the OCC ultimate and, and the similar, you know, you're still gathering points and all this to, to earn your place here. But, uh, but a little bit of a difference in how we're going to present the clashes and, and, and just a little bit of a, of a cash uh, incentive. Uh, amazing. And then obviously, you know, you want to help any community tournaments, things like that go on. So um, I, I highly recommend it if you're out there and you're interested in esports or you want to cast or you want to run tournaments, things like that. Like that's such a great opportunity for you to practice, hone your skills, do all that good stuff, run your own tournament. You'll, you'll, you'll be able to cast it guaranteed, especially with the access to spectator mode and things like that. It'll give you such a great opportunity to, to be able to just hone those skills. So I think that's a great place to start from. Awesome to hear that you're encouraging that and, and prizes and all that good stuff. So a uh, thumbs up from that. And then all these changes, they're all going to be in the dev blog, correct? Absolutely. You can read all the details and, and, and a little bit more um, of the stuff around that and, and some of our reasoning uh, in the dev blog. Amazing. That is out now? That is out um, now. Yeah, exactly. I'm pushing okay. the button. <laughs> Perfect. Well, well, okay. You can push the button, but um, we, we do have a grand finals about to happen. So I highly recommend y'all stick around for maybe the next like hour and then you can go read the dev blog. No problem. It'll still be there. I promise. Um, awesome. Alien, exciting stuff coming up. Any last words, last thoughts before we, uh, we move on to the finals of this OCC ultimate? Just the absolute best of luck to uh, to both Birdo and Tiger in this upcoming Grand Finals. I feel like every single game that we've seen in the last couple of days has has been a really epic fight of Titans, and this is the real culmination. So let's uh, let's see what these two big guys have to bring for us. Uh, amazing. Thank you so much, Alien. Thank you for all that information. If you do have questions about it, I'm sure you can track Alien down. If not, hit me up on Twitter, the one Christo. I will happily bother her during our next Frontline podcast, asking her all the questions. So thank you so much, Alien. Enjoy the grand finals. Let's get into it. Bubbles, Flake, we've made it. We've made it to the big game, the grand finals of the first ever OCC Ultimate, Birdo Burrito versus Tiger. 1,000 USD on the line. Bubbles, are, are, are you ready for this? I mean, I'm certainly ready. The question is, are the players ready? You know, I, I think there's been a lot building up to this. It's been a two-day event for a lot of these players that have only ever done one-day events before, so it's a lot bigger in scale. And, and there's just a lot more to mentally prepare yourself for. So I, I'm absolutely ready. I, I cannot wait. In fact, um, I just I'm very curious about how our players are feeling about this and sort of what's going through your mind when there is such a large amount of money on, on the line. I want to ask you something else specifically, because I know you know the players fairly well. And I was casting with um, Birdo in, in a couple of the clashes, and he was making jokes about how Ollie used to always introduce him as like, oh, we've got Jaking and we have Jaking's friend Birdo. And so obviously there's a lot of money on the line. Obviously um, there's a lot of, there's some high stakes, but do you think it's in the back of Birdo's mind that like, hey, this is my opportunity to really, uh, you know, create a name for myself and build up my legacy in cards by winning the first ever OCC Ultimate? I mean, I, I think there's obviously always the, the sort of legacy and the the fame and all, or not maybe not fame, but, you know, the glamour that comes with winning. Um, and that, that's always going to be on the line. But I think it's gotten to the point with Berto where he has proved and established himself already as as a fierce competitor, independent um, from who he knows or sort of who he grew up alongside. Um, so I, I think, sure, if this was Birdo's first sort of tournament, if this was Birdo's first sort of success 
in a tournament, then that may be a factor for him. But I think he's established himself enough in the community now where most people view Birdo as a sort of independent figure who is you know capable of these of these high level plays so i imagine for him it's not really so much a factor um as it may have been you know a year or so ago right on and and flake now you know we're getting to an event finals thousand dollars on the line big stakes it's been two days a lot of gameplay how do you get focused at moments like that to make sure that hey this i i need to be on point here this is the most important game that i've played over the past two days and you know this is the culmination of three months going into it so i've i've had the privilege of casting matches where there was like literally like 50 grand on the line and i've asked those players i said what's the deal like how do you actually separate this match from your testing or whatnot and they said well it's very difficult to because there's always so much at stake uh, but what they practice is essentially it starts uh, preparing for this starts with your practice matches and all the way through the qualifiers and whatnot. And that is basically getting the reps so that when situations do occur, you don't have opportunity to make mistakes because you know, precisely the muscle memory kicks in. It's like, this is what I do with five credits. This is what I do on my turn one. This is my ideal. This is how I have to shift. The main focus here is just not overthinking things and not, getting beyond yourself you have x amount of time on the clock every single turn to basically move the pieces around and play with the same amount of credits the the situation will always remain the same once the turn passes so it's merely about weighing the options and not being too hasty you have the time use it you might know what this turn looks like but maybe you don't know what the follow-up turn looks like so you take the time of every single turn to just evaluate and essentially invest the time of this particular turn perhaps into figuring out the possibilities of the next it's all about prep and taking your damn time because i've seen too many tournaments where somebody just does something out of sequence because it seems straightforward and then they forget a trigger they forget a disruption effect or a destruction effect or something and it changes everything so just literally this game is the most important game you'll probably play all year to a degree, but it also, you got to treat it like every, every other day. Yeah. I think, I think that's a great call out because prep is such a big part of it, but also taking your time because you, you almost develop that muscle memory. Oh, on turn, on turn six, I just play famed retreat. That's just what I do on turn six every time. But every once in a while, there is that alternate play you have to look at and you have to consider. So taking a moment, stopping and thinking about your current situation is so critical uh, when, when it comes to these events. So um, let's let's take a look at the decks one last time. Let's get acclimatized to what we're going to see here in front of us. Uh, we got Tiger's List up first, Bubbles. Uh, we've talked about it all weekend. This is something uh, a little bit more unique than what we're used to um, in, in these tournament lineups. Yeah, so we've got some familiar things in here like Brit Air and, you know, for some older players, Heinz might be familiar. Um, but we also have this South Damage with Italy Ally, which we saw really pulling through against Jagro. The ability to heal yourself very quickly of that man Ostrom, especially in sequence of cards like OG34 or the SU76, which have these very high attack amounts. So you're able to heal yourself up very, very quickly. And then this Fast Heinz deck here, it, it's a bit of a, an older deck, and it, it's sort of been pushed out a little bit in favor of things like Jagro, in favor of things like US Frontline, notably both of which Tiger doesn't actually have. Um, and they brought this this Heinz deck in instead it does trade very well with things like the the Panzer 2A it's got free defense it's able to trade very well and it can play very very quick especially if you're able to get cards like Drive or Fast Heinz or Nashup these are all cards which can help you play super super quickly the most traditional deck here for Tiger is Brit Air this is a deck everyone has seen this is a deck everyone's familiar with this is a sort of deck where you know you boot up cards for the first time you play the tutorial and the tutorial bot has gone rogue and has brought Brit Air instead this is just how <laughs> popular this deck is it's, it's all over the place and it's quite hard to get away from it and we see tiger no escapee from that bringing brit air even though they're not bringing the other very popular meta lists and then we're seeing another air deck this is japan brit air it's somewhat similar to the brit air list it tries to capture some of the same advantages you know hitting from your support line taking advantage of bombers and and this empire strikes as well as cards like lend lease 
Uh, but it is a little bit slower. It does rely a little bit more on RNG and trying to find the, the pieces that fit together because you don't have these four copies of Close S what to rely on. But overall, it does do a fairly good job at emulating this Brunel list. And there are quite a few elites in there, which the, the Brunel list can't get, which this deck really takes advantage of. Things like Audacity, the second Raiden Brigade, the Rule of the Skies and the Desperate Measures. These are all really key elites to look out for because these can swing the course of the game independently on their own absolutely and we talked about this being you know a, a slightly different lineup than what we've typically seen but tiger who came in here is the eighth seat dethroned head who was the first seed um in the quarterfinals and has gone through and, and done nothing but you know punch his ticket through to these uh these grand finals so um, love to see somebody bringing something a bit different and seeing success with it and hopefully that continues to bleed into our our future events here on the other side we got birdo burrito who uh, went ahead and stuck with things um a little bit more of the classic variety bubbles yeah, still bringing this South Damage deck, which has turned out to be sort of one of the surprises and one of the things where it was a bit of a black sheep coming into the event. Not everyone was thinking about it or looking at it, but it's actually proved to be really, really quite good in the current meta, especially with strong removal pieces to help you deal with things like Brit Air and Frontline. You know, especially this Red Dawn is really, really powerful. And this Winter Warfare to deal with the Jaguar decks that most people are bringing. So this deck here, little bit of a rogue, little bit not expected but actually proves itself to be really quite consistent. And I believe we've seen Berto playing the, the self damage mirror already in this event and being able to pull through in that against Moy in his first round. And then the other decks of Berto, they're all a little bit more traditional, really the most popular decks of this event. We've got this US frontline list. This is something, again, a lot of people have seen this, a lot of people are familiar with this. And there's some runaway cards in here that can just explode and take the game on their own. We've got Red devils you get this into the front line it can win on its own you've got sky train which has really been showing a, a lot of difficulty for a lot of opponents in this where someone establishes a red devils and then establishes a sky train and you know sometimes your opponent can deal with the sky train eventually but by the time they dealt with that it spit out like four or five different one drops and created some real problems and then we do have the m4 sherman the backbone of this deck similar to a convoy drawing two cards for free the sherman draws two cards for four but also leaves you with a four for body so you're effectively spending one credit for a four foot body which is really really the backbone of this deck um, and then this Brit Air list again everyone's seen this everyone's familiar with this we do have the Parisian here some people prefer this some don't it's just really good at dealing with these beefed up big units and then this Jagra list what most people are used to I think once again everyone has seen this deck Berto not too fond of the Akita regiments but found himself still having to run three of them because there is just not a better two drop to run in this deck at the moment there are a few options that I've seen people try but this here is sort of what you can expect this is the the most standard build i think that's going around other than the bombing raid most people have gone around to two down to two orders birdo sticking with the three orders but other than that bombing raid this is almost like your most bog standard jaguar deck that you could expect to see right on let's uh let's just dive right into the bands no guessing no questions no confusion let's just see exactly what happened here and uh and we can discuss a bit afterwards instead of making predictions and there you now go you A B B. the finalists speak for themselves you know when you're in the finals there's no more time to mess around banning japan air or something like that exactly so you go ahead and you say yeah we're just not going to deal with that brit airless we're going to push that aside and uh and just go dive into things um, and you know, I, I think this is so interesting as well, because you do have just the best players going in and saying, Hey, we, we recognize the strength of the Brit side. Um, and we're going to go ahead and, and remove that. So I think that that is, uh, is a huge piece here, especially when you recognize the fact that, um, you know, Birdo is bringing his Soviet self damage list that he's shown that he's very strong with tiger is bringing a variety of decks, including that kind of inverse list that he's very strong with. Uh, no, nobody has any questions. It's just straight up ban Brit. It works. If it works, don't set, don't switch with it. ABB, it's, it's there for a reason. You know, this deck is so dominant. It's been so dominant for a while. And like Flake touched on earlier, you can tell how dominant the deck is because of how many people are taking their deck to counter it. Absolutely. So let's get into it. We are going to see uh, 
it's not quite a mirror matchup, but it will be Japan versus Japan in this first match of the grand finals of our first ever OCC Ultimate. A lot of good options in Berto's hand here. You have the Signal Regiment, you have the Beef Wagon, and you have the Dina. These are all really, really strong when playing against decks like this Japan Air. You have the ability to burn them out. You have the ability to get a lot of resources out quickly with the Dina and the Beef Wagon. This could be a very good start for Berto. Berto finding the Signal Regiment, frankly, I think is the greatest thing he could have hoped for here, especially if he's... Feigned as well. Yeah, he's got it all set up here, and uh, nice, <laughs> nice opener to be, to, and and the top deck as well, just to go ahead and just own that front line. Take a look at this. Hey, there we go. Uh, couldn't do that without the two one just off the top. So Berto, pretty happy with his opener here. A few options for Tiger on how Tiger wants to respond. You know, there's Aichi obviously does risk being traded out. Uh, you do get the residue, the extra Aichi that comes after, but it's not an ideal situation. The Albuquerque, Albuquerque obviously not ideal because it would also just be traded, but there is no perfect card here, and you sort of just have to deploy something and hope for the best. Try and save yourself some face damage and distract with some units a little bit. Sometimes it, it literally just becomes a matter of when you're trading units like that, it just becomes extra extra defense for your HQ, right? It's just a little extra longevity. Now, Birdo's really laying it on thick here, and one Look bomber that operates for two just seems like a little bit too expensive. That's a lot of AoE in Tiger's hand, though, which gives Tiger just a lot of options on how to deal with this board. Now, if Birdo sees this supply shortage come out, while that will sting a little bit to see this board be wiped away, it does mean your signal regiment is more safe, because this supply shortage is a really good way of dealing with signal regiment over time so birdo this is going to be a bit of a you know an up and a down for him it means you can deploy this signal in relative safely which is what he's doing here and the type 94 as well and then just going straight to face just pushing it if you can that three two bomber is hidden under smoke screen i don't think that the issue with the bomber is that it operates for two so it's not an efficient way to to push through but again it does trade very effectively it's just going to cost you i think that at the moment, Birdo's probably going to push as much damage as he possibly can. Um, but it, it's going to be difficult because that signal regiment is going to, like you mentioned, just slowly over time chip away at that health total. So trading, Birdo just needs to put bodies on the board, push them forward, and eventually just hope to dodge any kind of way that Tiger can deal with that signal regiment. I mean, ideally for Berto here, you're dumping your hand as quickly as possible to set up this on-curve feigned. You know, if you can feign on turn six, you want to be losing as little resources as possible. So just dump and dump as much as you can. Um, just to point out for anyone joining us just for the finals, there is a slight unfortunate bug with the replay feature where the clock does tick down on screen. Uh, there is nothing we can do about this, unfortunately, when bringing you a live event. So it is just going to have to be something that people, unfortunately, are going to have to put up with. Type 94, getting a second surprise attack. That's a nice way to just point, click, delete that bomber in the back row. There's still, you know, there's still the one, two bomber, but now there's multiple threats on the board and that signal regiment putting in the work over time. Tiger now has a swordfish in hand, a KI and air superiority. So he's going to go after that signal regiment. This you got to think that this is definitely the safest play to go is just to get that card off the board. I, I think Tiger's also thinking that I have this Lenny's in hand so I can expend resources fairly comfortably with the knowledge that I'm just going to better refill in the future. I imagine a lot of Tiger's thought process at the moment is if I can get as much board established as possible, it makes the Lenny's as safe as a move as possible because I don't need to worry as much if I have all these bombers on board. Whirlwind, a very nice find for the Birdo. It did make a difficult decision where you have to decide do I go for the Whirlwind or do I go for the KI-46 because I'm pretty sure Birdo is going to be one of the slam this feigned retreat as soon as possible considering just how few resources and options he has in hand. Yeah, he was, you know, he was a little bit uh, pressed for resources there as it, the, the option was to either put the verbal vin into the front line and attack or establish two units. And I like this move, knowing that he's up against an air deck. Having that in the front line is definitely going to buy him a little bit of time, but it does sacrifice the KI-46 in order to play that fan, that uh, the feign on, on, uh, on curve. He may go for the KI-46 still. The logic may be if he can find a Type 93 that buffs the Whirlwind's attack and he's then able to take out the Swordfish. So I imagine we'll, he'll see what Tiger does. If Tiger pins the Whirlwind, then I imagine he'll just slam the Feigned Retreat. But there is a difficult decision where you could try and look for one of these Type 93s. 
and Tiger deciding to deploy the, the Sonya into the pen. So not and... exactly the right draw that he was looking for here. So, But you do have the opportunity here to actually start putting in some work. There's the Type 93, though. So that Able definitely to take helps out. out that swordfish. Just as Birdo would have been hoping, really. That's almost as perfect as you can find from that. Really, you would have preferred an Arado to the Bicycle, just because if there is an Empire Strikes, that allows you to follow it up with something. But this is still a very, very strong position now for Birdo. Sendai Regiment, in case you want to go ahead and clip something, but it uh, looks like Tiger's going to take the safe route, draw two cards, and hope for something to, to draw. He does find some uh, bombing pretty, raid. Pretty good draw there. The bombing raid able to clear the front line, and then you can push up the Type 94 and trade it into the Type 93. You know, the battle of these little uh, Japanese tanks here. However, this does still set Birdo up for a fairly good turn to play Feigned Retreat. The main issue with Feigned Retreat is when you're dropping it into an enemy established board and you risk dying before you can re-establish your board. But I don't think Birdo needs to be too worried about that and is going to be fairly comfortable dropping this in the knowledge that he's not under any threat. Cleaning up the front line with the bombing run, moving forward. And like you mentioned, a little tank on tank crime there going to clean up and buy some time. Again, the lend lease in Tiger's hand is going to replenish the hand, but is it going to have enough time? So he can drop 15th and go feign retreat here. I don't think that that Sendai regiment is really going to get him a lot of value. I, I don't know how afraid he is of a bomber while he has a, a fighter in the hand. So feign retreat is what we're going to be doing here. And I like holding this 15th cavalry back. This obviously protects it from the bomber, but it also means that, you know, if this 15th Cavalry is alive, if you top deck something like a um, Panzer 35T, you get this operation cost for free, which can be really, really important when you're feigning on curve. If you top deck a Panzer 35T and you don't have an infantry, it can just be too slow for it to be as useful as you'd like it to be. So what's the worst draw that you can get after? You know, you play the feigned retreat, you have no cards in hand anymore, you're basically oh hoping... Rage. Bombing raid would be, be bombing raid because then you don't get to do this big draw engine. There are some bad ones, you know. Sheedin could be problematic. Obviously, you can shoot and hit face and pressure lethal, but you know there's this surprise attack in Sheedin in um, Tiger's hand. And here we see the benefit of that feign retreat as everybody just get in here. We're gonna drop in some blitz units. There's a verbal vin, great pickup as well. Has to All decide, right. do I want to put down the Whirlpool Wind and go for the trade, or do I want to pin? Now, what was a really, really nice play there is you see Berto put down the Whirlpool Wind before moving to the front line. And these are the little plays that elevate Jaguar players to just, like, people say this deck is, is no skill and all go. But by playing the Whirlpool Wind there, you look for a Beef Wagon, and if you find a Beef Wagon, you then get that for free. And it's just these little plays that can take you from, like, a sort of 50% win rate to a 60-plus percent win rate. These little plays that just crawl out this little bit extra damage. So a pair of lend leases and nine credits to his name. This means that Tiger can, can't draw and attack with his uh, air unit. So that is a decision that needs to be made on his end here as Birdo has the feigned retreat online and ready to go. As you can see, he drew one card and established an entire board full of presence. So a very powerful play, something that Birdo's glad to have been able to do on curve. Uh, there's the lend lease drawing up some cards, does find an albacore. So that will deal uh, one damage and pin a unit. I would imagine he's looking to just possibly put some more meat on the on the board here there's not much else he can do the only problem is if you deploy it now you just make it pinned instantly by this verbal wind i don't think you have much choice but to drop it it's just it's such a scary position and it also means if this albacore dies you're then setting up um you're, you're taking away the setup for an empire strikes Birdo having a few different options on how to play this turn. The order in which you play these units can be really, really important because obviously you draw from each unit and sometimes the things you draw completely change the options and how you would play a turn. Now, Looks Birdo... to me like he's got enough burn here to, to really make it hurt because the bombing run does have the opportunity to actually target the HQ, right? So if he's it's... just in a situation where he's just got to find... Um, a window to get Tiger perhaps in a, a quick one-two punch over two turns. And we may see this surprise attack come out. A lot of people try to save this for the kill effect only, but you can use this just to pin down and then buy time. And then like you say, this bone raid can just come in and finish the game. He just needs to do a little bit extra damage to face. And then this is a great finisher just to 
take you over that uh, finish line and just do that last little bit of extra damage. A few choices for Taika. You can go for the zero and you can go for the red and brigade as well as the pin. So it's going to be able to deal with four units in the front line. Zero ping. So uh, you lead with the raiding. Actually, do you lead with the raiding? Oh, this is difficult. Tough position because to sit you, on here. you can't raid and brigade kill this whirlwind because of this. Is he just going to look for the desperate measures? That might be the option here. Again, play to win versus play not to lose. There's a situation where he's going to eventually have to to make a, a call to, to figure it out. But uh, doesn't no find it. No. Does find the air superiority, but Berto starting to realize that Tiger does not have an answer to this board. And Tiger is going to have to make a decision. How can I mitigate the most damage? I don't think there's any way of yeah. I don't think there's any way of avoiding lethal here. And Tiger recognizing it. And Birdo taking an early game in the grand finals of the first ultimate by fading early, fading on curve, and just getting these really effective uh, draw engines going as soon as possible. So Birdo. Converting on his Japanese aggro list, both players have no access to British uh, British air, as it were. Uh, the difference here lies in not just the, the nations, but also Tiger's builds have been quite unique. And he's got his work cut out for him, got all the way to the finals here of the OCC Ultimate, playing meta decks with bubbles. That's the beauty about, you know, meta decks is that if they're effective they if they you know become the meta so we'll see how this tournament in general kind of shifts perhaps the landscape of the ladder as well if these are decks that can actually consistently tackle some of the more egregious uh decks that lurk on the ladder then they themselves actually become the meta so tiger here making a statement with a little bit of creativity and big brain place however he is under the gun now as Berto takes the first game and he's coming on back it's soviet on soviet so both players uh playing the mirror on either side now this is an actually a really interesting mirror because in this mirror it's usually seen as advantageous to go second and Berto has managed to to be quite lucky and been fortunate enough to go second the reason play being is you want to be playing your removal card to reduce things cost so you want to be reacting to your opponent as well as it's often a battle of resources and when you go second you just have more resources at hand to play around with so one of the few matchups where going second is often seen as preferable and i think Berto is very very strong Strong and and very comfortable in this mirror so i think going into this berto probably feels very very confident but that is not to say that this is berto's game or that tiger is not perfectly capable of winning winter warfare deal a little bit of damage draw some cards no problem two resources floating here the yak looks like the right way to go and you do have a little bit of a meat shield in the front row to protect you from the tank but the tank operating for relatively cheap here is going to have a nasty trade potentially on either you, one of these. You could get both these six sixes down this turn. If you go for the bloody sickle on the recon and then you go for the red dawn on this unit in the back line, both of these 34th go down to one cost and you can deploy both of them essentially for free. You could even sickle your own unit if you wanted to, which allows you to move up the tank. It just seems a little bit unnecessary when you can get both of them down this turn anyway. A lot of stats on the board now. Birdo gonna have to figure out how to respond, get a good chunk of his own stats on the board. But with this Ura in hand, Tiger does potentially have the capabilities of just burning Birdo out. You could move up and get Birdo down to nine health, let Birdo come to you a little bit, and then just Ura for lethal. It's a lot of meat on the board. The players just playing, you know, trying to one-up each other, having relatively the same amount of tools at their disposal as well. But here comes the first tank and uh, the follow-up as well. He's just loading up the front. You can't pay for the aura here. However, you do have access to that that uh, that front line, which is so nasty. I'm gonna go for the sickle, which will set up this tank trade. I this like this. First... That's it, actually, it's a very neat play. Yeah, it's very neat. Very good. I, I mean, it's a it's a decent play in terms of just making sure that you know you're giving your opponent nothing of of value here, and the way that he's going to have to clear up these six sixes, which is something that they're you know, Berto's going to have to deal with this sooner than later because Tiger's essentially setting up the kill shot here, and the question is. You know, does Birdo have the tools to protect through it? Do you have to Ura yourself and clear out one of these units? How does this, how are you getting around this is the question. 
I, I, I think first rifles is probably the best tool in Berto's hand just to buy a little bit of time, but that's still just buying time, and you're still very vulnerable to cards like Ura, which help you push through these guards very effectively because you get to use that leftover damage to go face. What Berto does have on his side is the card advantage, but Berto going a slightly slower route and potentially making himself very vulnerable to an Ura play this go. Winter Warfare might just be able to take it across the finish line. Goes for the Ura. And that, that is game right there. Doesn't even need to use the Winter Warfare. My, my apologies for the maths. And Tiger able to swing back in game two. Able to use the tempo advantage and, and win the match in which I imagine Birdo felt very, very comfortable in. And Tiger able to pull it back instead and lead it to a 1-1 one, one equal footing. Yeah, that was a close one at, uh, up until it wasn't, uh, so to speak, as both, uh, you know, both players really were kind of just matching each other pound for pound until I mean, ultimately you're able to get that one extra fat boy on the board and create a scenario where it's not in your advantage to trade. And then you could basically value your trade, value trade your way into a free pass. And frankly, the, the splash over damage that Ura provides gives inevitability and just a, co a continuous threat to uh to anything in the front line frankly i i think that bloody sickle play onto the 6-6 in burlow's back line and trading his tank away was the play right there and it's one of those very little plays but i think it won um tiger the game on its own it's just very interesting to see how these tiny little plays can have such a big impact on the outcome of the game now we see tiger going back to this japan airlist and birdo sticking with the soviet south damage Birdo does have a lot of removal in this deck, which will allow him to, to sort of reach the back line a lot more effectively. But you are vulnerable to bombers, and especially things which can blitz out damage like the she did. You have to keep that in mind and make sure you're guarding your HQ when you're on low HP amounts. So this is a very interesting matchup, and I think it's going to rely a lot on skill and how each of these players use the resources and utility to their advantage. Opening up with a bomber, one, two bomber is a nice opener to have. I mean, it's not quite a swordfish, but it does some work in itself, clearing up some potential early game units. But Berto's got none, so it's not a big worry yet. Uh, cards like Petliakov, how important is that particular card in this matchup? So it's not as important as it is against, say, USA Frontline or something like this, where the deployment effects are sort of the core of the deck. But there are some very, very big deployment abilities that you can hit. Obviously, the Zero has quite a nice deployment ability in this one damage ping. But then things like the Raiding Brigade, these are the sorts of things where this deployment effect can be really, really beneficial. Birdo having a little bit of a difficult turn too. Just going to have to sort of decide what is the most effective way to use their resources. Just going to chuck down the guard. He knows it's vulnerable. He knows it's probably Probably gonna die but i think it's just to try and save a little bit of face damage and if tiger doesn't go for the trade it then offers Bodo a lot of possibilities in how to play this so there you go tiger just saying all right uh, i'm gonna deal a little bit of damage here might as well just clean it up but that's the entire turn right sometimes that's okay Bodo is not necessarily establishing that unit particularly as a threat but perhaps to just buy some times it's it's a it's a unit that can be threatening if left to its own devices so Birdo saying, all right, if you want to deal with this, it's going to cost you your turn, giving me a little bit more leeway to do what I want to do. There's the Petliakov now. This is, you know, it, it's not necessarily a threat in itself well, on this turn. The audacity. It will do five damage because it gets buffed up by this other Aichi, and it's just the perfect answer to this Petliakov. However, it does open Tiger up to being vulnerable to a Winter Warfare plus Bloody Circle play. As it stands now, there's the Bloody Sickle opening things up. Tiger has a three-pack of bombers in the back row. They're very, they're a little bit of glass cannon action as they're not very robust. However, they have been doing work. Bloody Sickle times two. You're going to find two times the nastiness. There's the Winter Warfare following that up with a nice, robust 6-6 six, six on the board. And how quickly Birdo has kind of changed the dynamic of the game here as Tiger really had done a good job of, of bolstering that support line with bombers that have reached that trade very well. Birdo with just infantry right now doesn't have the mobility that he may need, but he does have the body to withstand a pounding to start things off. 
However, with all these bombers and artillery in Tiger's hand, Tiger looks to better just re-establish a lot of what was problematic for Berto. Berto going to have to figure out the best way to use his removal to deal with these. Some very interesting decisions here. Obviously, these Aichi's destruction effects spawn in another Aichi. So Berto has the choice of removing an Aichi and removing the AA gun, or just fully removing both Aichi. So just, you know, kill the Aichi, a new one spawns up, kill the additional one. You also have the Kyusha, which you can attempt to high roll and try and figure out a way to kill these things using the high roll. So he's going for Red Dawn here. Put down the T-80, go to the front line. It, it, it's a very sensible play. It may even bait Tiger into thinking about trying to face race with the naval operation, at which point Berto can use the GPW, the Great Patriotic War, to reset both HQs to 12 and try and swing it back in his favor. Desperate measures, though, a very, very strong find for Tiger. Those bombers now looking more vulnerable as there's a 6-6 infantry in the front line and a tank that mo that moves for free, operates for nothing. Uh, there's the naval operation, so everybody's going to get a little bit of a haircut here and get nailed to the boards as they're not going anywhere. And uh, a naval surprise as well is probably, or sorry, the surprise attack is going to go ahead and clean up that 6-5 in the front row. So work has been done here. Tiger opting at this rate to say, all right, let's just get rid of your stuff here and uh, give myself some options. But here's everybody's favorite son, the Katusha. I mean, it only needs to connect once. That's not the scary part here. Red Dawn going to do its work as well. So both players playing cleanup here. The Zamboni's just been passed a few times on the board. Rule the Skies, potentially a very strong find for Tiger here. Tiger is able to play Rule the Skies and then go for the desperate measures. And he's going to be able to do a lot of damage to face this turn. Going to put Berto in a very difficult scenario if that is the route that the Tiger decides to take. When you cast this Rule the Skies, it means the enemy HQ gets a debuff where whenever it takes three or more damage, all your air units get plus one, plus one. So there's an opportunity, I think, to go ahead and play, you know, equalize the life totals at 12 and still play the 34th off the discount. So there's still things to be done. There's the Desperate Measures. But it can work. With this bomber getting buffed, Birdo is obviously going to have to use this GPW this turn. It's just, it's getting to the point where even with this GPW and a 34th on board, Tiger can most likely just hit face and race down Birdo before Birdo is able to react at all. That bomber in the back row of the 3-3 three, three is just looming there. There is a an opportunity to actually kill it if you want to. Unfortunately, you do have to GPW first, or you uh, <laughs> KO that yourself on the spot. This is what I'm telling you, baby. Sequencing matters. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's the difference of life and death in this case. So there's the GPW, Great Patriotic War. Both players reset to 12. Now the question is, do you establish the 34th, or do you kill the bomber? I think you well, have to kill the bomber here. You can actually follow up the 34th after if you if you use the Red Dawn to kill the bomber because of that cost reduction. But Birdo instead saying my health is too vulnerable and developing developing the from the people, which I think may actually be a mistake. It may have been a misclick or something because the moment Tiger hits face, this bomber is just going to get out of from the people range. And it just took damage. He took the three damage that he was saving anyways, right? So it, I feel it, like yeah, it may have been. A misclick, he may have clicked on the wrong option. There may have been something I've not taken into account. But Berto struggling against the air deck and just going to call it there. Tiger up 2-1, only needing to take one more game to take first place in the OCC Ultimate. But Berto still has a lot going for them, has a USA frontline list and a self damage list, both of which are well suited to be able to play against the fast Heinz deck, which Tiger is now forced to play. I, I told you at the start of this uh, of this matchup that, you know, it, treat it like any other match. You, you can't make small sequencing errors. You can't click too fast, even though, you know, sometimes you've played this game 10,000 times. It doesn't matter if you click too fast or you go too quickly uh, in terms of your decision, you know, running down the decision tree. That's where something like that occurs because... You had the opportunity, you may, you, like you mentioned, you say, well, I'm not going to kill it now. I want to establish, you know, uh, from the people because I don't want to take the three damage. But the bobber then does the three damage and becomes a 4-4 and now it's all 
it's all done anyway. So I don't think that Birdo is necessarily up against the clock, but hey, everybody's human. We've got more leeway here as Birdo needs to win the next two, where Tiger just needs to convert, and he starts off nice and heavy with another uh, the beef wagon in the front row at 2-1 as well. Warfare could potentially just swing this around. You can go for the Winter Warfare and you can go for the Bloody Sickle and clear the board right here, right now. You can also deploy this 456 rifles and just buy some time. Looks like he's actually going to opt for the card I like draw this. here. I, I like this trade, actually. You save this Bloody Sickle for when you have one of these rifle regiments on board so that you can protect it and buff it up. I, I think this is one of those really interesting examples of where both decks have a really strong and solid start. I mean, like you said, that start for Tiger was absolutely like just one of the most insane starts ever, where you, you get this beef wagon in for free and you have follow up for it the next turns after. But this is one of the strengths of this self damage deck is your opponent is able to get this beautiful start and you're able to just win to warfare, bloody sickle, and just stop them in their tracks. Birdo seems to have the remedy for every little ailment that tiger's tossing his way but again we've seen how these quick decks these fast decks operate it's not just about how quickly you can access the hq and start depositing damage it's how big quickly you could develop the board and move to that front line as well which is something that tiger has no problems doing here birdo found uh, a response uh, on his turn too does he have a response uh moving forward as well the petliakov might be a great opportunity as well it will shut down something like the sendai regiment so that's something that you want to hold there as well as uh you know potentially the 30 the 35th guards uh, the 34th guards as well getting a little bit of a discount as well so um is this where you establish the petliakov and hope oh, to maybe dodge the difficult, sendai? difficult decisions here you can put down the petliakov you could petliakov red dawn and that puts you in a really comfortable position but if you put down this su-76 and go for the red dawn as well you buff up your unit by a large amount and reduce 34th by a large amount as well and it lets you use this 70 uh 76 a lot sooner so it's just a very difficult decision on how birdo wants to take this do i want to go for the petliakov and play around sendai or do i want to get the su-76 down looks like he's leaning towards petliakov I like the, the, the Petliakov move I like because it does turn off a Sendai regiment on curve, which you as you're building up your guard here with all the self damage you're taking, having something like Sendai regiment just negate all the work you've done can be backbreaking. Plus, establishing a bomber in the back row is pretty huge as well. It's gonna take some, you know, it's gonna take a, a double surprise attack or something along those lines to kill it, which you know, is not I, easy to do, but... I mean, with the Petlikov down, actually, this surprise attack is something I hadn't considered at first. You see there's one surprise attack in Tiger's hand, but these Type 94s need a deployment effect to get the second surprise attack. So by dropping the Petlikov, he actually protects his board from surprise attacks. And it, it's something I hadn't considered at first, where actually when you drop this Petlikov, you know there's only one surprise attack until it's been removed, and you don't need to play around the second one at all. So he's just setting up an opportunity here to perhaps bust through a little later, just stopping the any kind of response from the Petliakov. But here's a whole bunch of damage that can potentially go ahead and clear out the guard, but it's going to be costly. It's not just a matter of the operation cost. It's the fact that you're uh, you're giving your opponent a two-for-one trade. Uh, he's holding on to the remaining... warfare. That is significant. So what you can do, yeah, you can drop this second guard, you can go for the Winter Warfare, and then you can either go for the value trade, because the Type 93 is down, and yeah, deploy this as well. This is just, at this point, this is Birdo's game, and I don't see what Tiger can do to pull it back. Deployment effects are turned off, you can't use something like an Enigma to draw yourself out of it, and there you go. Tiger identifying that there's just no way to crawl back from this, and Birdo finally able to get this win with this Soviet self damage. And we are going to a game five in the OCC Ultimate Grand Finals. There is a lot on the line for these players. They know the matchup, they know what they need to be doing. I, I think it's going to be nothing but pure focus for each of them at this point. 
What a matchup there for Birdo, finding precisely what he needs to just shut down. It seemed like everything thrown his way, he was able to dodge, deflect, and just otherwise parry. But it comes down to this, a fifth and deciding match for the OCC Ultimate. Is it Birdo? Is it Tiger? Both players bringing very unique decks, uh, very different decks. But it's going to come down to USA Frontline finds the 32nd and a Hellcat as well as, uh, I mean, he's Look operating on Tiger's Kirkland. hand here. Two early game infantry and two Panzer 35Ts. There's a lot of early aggression here. I think this is going to be a game of Tiger putting on the aggression and Berto just doing his best to survive. And if Berto can hold back for long enough, then I think it'll be Berto's game. Well, this is exceptionally difficult here to digest, mainly because Berto is... You know, he has, if he was going first, it'd be a whole different story. You open up with the 32nd, you start thinning your deck, finding ways to match the aggression that uh, Tiger's putting on the board here. But watch this. It's going to be the Panzer 35T. Options are plenty. And a beef wagon in hand. So if Birdo's able to clear the board, which he may very well want to do on his turn with the dive bombing and the trade, this is sort of what you see as the most optimal play on paper. You clear the board. It sets Tiger up to go for a bicycle into Panzer 35T into a beef wagon and Berto not getting drawn into it saying okay I'll play this a little bit slower but it still does give Tiger a lot of opportunity to put a lot of pressure on the board. I don't think you are you try to be greedy or try to be too cute with your plays here I think that you're just maintain the board keep put piling on um, at a certain point I, you got to think that Berto will find a way to clear the front line and then maybe the beef wagon you could you could play it when you need to but I don't see why you need to be cute about this i think it's just laying on as thick as possible here your opponent is on the back foot you've got damage aplenty so let's just lay it on thick as it seems to me like he is just already halfway to being the occ oh, and he ultimate finds another 30 second off the top that is a terrible draw for him here he's gonna have to do a little bit of spring cleaning but again he's gonna find a very terrible surprise as that front line is wide open but here it comes uh bubbles it's beef wagon time and if you move up this beef wagon and put down the murder, this forces Berto to deal with this murder. Berto is going to have to use patrol to get rid of the murder and prevent Tiger from drawing, at which point for Tiger, you just have more of a board presence. Doing his best here. Gonna go ahead and crush the backline trade up as best as possible. He's in survival mode. Now, the benefit here is that Tiger is on. Oh, no! Oh, no! What a draw! Enigma at the perfect time with an empty hand. Gonna draw five here, Bubbles. And this just brings Tiger all the way right back into this. Semper Fi indeed. Berto now from the back foot to on his back at this situation. Been just right. pushed over by Tiger. Opting here to... He's considering, is it Panzer time? How are we gonna develop the board? He looks like he's just gonna go ahead and clean up now. He did manage to get it, but is it too little too late here, Bubbles? Is putting the work in I as best as he has? it might be. With this Marder in hand as well for Tiger, each of these trades is card neutral for Tiger. You put down the Marder, you go for the trade with this 15th Cavalry, and you just draw new cards to replace it. I think it's just important that you look to put down this Panzer 35T first if you want to reestablish the front line before going for this trade. So there's the Panzer 35T, it sees an infantry, gets inspired, says, I work for free. It, is, it goes to the front line, it's going to connect with the HQ. Down to five here. Red Devils can be a way to go ahead and just reestablish the front line if necessary. Just create a little bit of friction, as it were. Uh, Red Devils creating a scenario where if you want to operate into it, it's going to cost you a little more, but... As a early game. Good PIR buff though. PIR buffing the, the Red Devils and not greeting out to buff itself. Helping out here. But still, a lot of options for Tiger. A lot of avenues to play this. There's a Hellcat and... for Birdo, which allows for a little bit of aggression with the Blitz effect. There's a half track if you need to sort of push someone back. And there's also, a, is that a strat bombing in hand? It is indeed a strat bombing. I think the main way that Tiger loses this right now, if Tiger goes for this value trade and then deploys a bunch of units, then I 
can see Birdo just going for this strat bomb and wiping out this back line. Now, yes, this Panzer Free in hand can give tanks blitz, but it can only give German tank blitz, Germans tank blitz. So these Jap Japanese tanks aren't going to have blitz. They're going to be stuck in the support line. And this looks like this could be a game changing strategic bombing here for Birdo. Things have changed, ladies and gentlemen. Birdo Burrito seems to have been really up against it, but a little bit of resilience here as Tiger goes completely haywire, pulls everybody onto the back line. Here's there a it is. Strip bombing. And Birdo really turning this around. He should move up the PIR and not the Howcat, I think, because the Howcat can move up and attack in a future turn, whereas the PIR can only move up. There are still ways out of this for Tiger. All Tiger needs to do is get a Panzer 35T or a Whirlwind into the front line, and he's going to be able to close out the game with this Blitzkrieg. So Berto needs multiple units in the front line. Lots of surprise attacks, lots of send eyes, lots of way for Tiger to clear the front line and try and establish just any tank in the front line to set up this Blitzkrieg. It all comes down to these next few turns. Berto has done a great job here of, of remaining, you know, in this game. You could see the, the emoting that he was doing saying, all right, like, you know, it's just kind of one of those. All right, you, you got me, you know, like you're you're you've got the nice curve here. I'm doing my best as the Sendai regiment gobbles up the tank at the front line, opening it up for business. There's a surprise attack and a pin the six one in the back line and say, screw it. Let's just get rid of it as uh, there's a Panzer. Panzer. bad timing on that. So I mean, now Birdo has very difficult decisions to make. You know, how do you play this in the safest possible options? You can fifth Rangers to the front line and Panzer 35T trade, but that does make you potentially vulnerable to, say, a second Sendai or something like that. So many decisions. Is the option here to go plus four, plus four, and just drop a fat boy in the front yard? I think the... it's just too vulnerable to any gonna go for the full four. I think it's just too vulnerable to some sort of targeted removal that just gets rid of it on the spot. You know, if you I'd... get the second Sendai, then it just deals with it instantly. Obviously, the Type 94s aren't a problem anymore because you've seen most of the surprise attacks ready. You know it's not going to be removed like that, but you need as many bodies in this front line as possible. Tiger, three options. It's going to be very important in what they take here. Being able to look through the, the cards in your deck here to find the right, the, you know, like the skeleton key to unlock this mystery as Tiger has come so close to the edge here, bringing Birdo to five. But Birdo, resilient. Uh, it's the fifth and deciding match of the OCC Ultimate. He doesn't want to give this up without a fight. He's owning the front, uh, the front line with some pretty hefty units in comparison. But we know that Tiger's got some tricks up his sleeve, opting to go ahead with the type. And so yeah, some, some trades coming in here as well. There isn't actually the second Sendai in Tiger's deck, but some win conditions that are in Tiger's deck are the FW-190 Jack Bomber. This is a 5-4 fighter that bounces a unit back to hand. This could potentially win the game on the spot, but also this auto cannon we saw earlier could be a very effective way to just do this little bit extra burn, as, as well as anything which can just reach the back line. So the Heinkel HE, it's a little bomber, but it might just better give Berto that little bit he... Uh, they might better give Tiger that little bit he needs. But now this 8-8 eight eight in the front Nine. Like you said before, is there a way you can establish this 8-8? And Berto's saying, yes, I can now. And this is a lot of stats. There's that Jag Bomber. The, and this is... I mean, Ty Tiger's got a little bit of cushion here at 17. He's got uh, you know, effectively two turns to just absorb some damage, but he's probably going to be looking to trade into the 4-4 here, not the, the most efficient. However, the most necessary at this point is you do have to find ways to actually convert on this. So if you get this Jag Bomber to bounce something to hand and you move any to attack tank to the front line, you can end the game there with a Blitzkrieg. So I'd really like to see this Beef Wagon come down this turn, and this gives you two options for units that can be blitzed into killing Berto. Berto finding a Sky Train, going to have to make some very difficult decisions. He needs to get rid of this tank. If he doesn't get rid of this tank, he could just lose the game on the spot. Well, oh, there's extra options in the front line He goes line for the here. trade. Finds the Red Devils. Panzer 2A is not quite enough to end this game. You can Jag Bomber. Bounce this Fifth Rangers. You can trade with your with your Sendai. And you're able to establish a front line. You can put Berto down to 4 HP this turn. 
Well, and not only that, but take a look at this. I mean, unless you have a way to deal with the backline. It's the... going to have to be the half track. You're going to have to half track that and you're going to have to clear this front line completely. And I think. I think that might be game. I don't see a way in which Burrow can find a way to deal with all of this board at once without dying to this Blitzkrieg. Looks like this is all Tiger's match to wrap up here as the Blitzkrieg leaves. Exactly lethal. Take it's going to be exactly that. lethal for Tiger in a, in a chilling match for the, for the final place for the OCC Ultimate. And Tiger going to go 3-2. Incredible game as Birdo made this a lot closer than it had any business being. Tiger was laying it on real thick. And ultimately, you know, Birdo just managed to find the right cards at the right time, make the right decisions. But it's difficult when you're starting that far behind and you have the options in hand. I think that one of the turning points of that match has got to be the Enigma draw off the top to just find the options and go from there. I, I think it's it's not common in tournaments for the final game of the tournament to be the best game in the whole tournament, but I'm fully confident saying today that that was the case. And I think we talked a lot about that last matchup and that last that last game, which was exceptional. But in looking through all five games, I don't think there was a point where either player really faltered. I don't know, Bubbles. You're you're you know much more of an expert than I am in in when it comes to cards. But like, I just couldn't pinpoint anywhere where either of those players really made a glaring mistake that could have cost them. I think both players went in and played exceptionally well in this finals. No, I I agree. I I think it was one of those series where. I was on the edge of my seat and I was trying to think what lines can they do? What can they do here? What can they do there? And half the time they would do something completely unexpected. And it just, it fills you with when, when you play competitively and you see a player do something you don't expect and it works and, and it's the right move. It fills you with a certain kind of joy. That's really hard to capture this sort of, Oh my God, this is high level gameplay. These are high level players. This is what I love to see. And I think I think you nailed that, Bubbles, because for me and, and Flake, I'd love to get your take on it, because as you mentioned before, you know, you've cast a variety of games, variety of levels, variety of prize pools. And I don't know what it was about this weekend, whether it was the fact that it was, you know, the culmination of three different events to get you into this one. The fact that it was two days long, the fact that it was a huge prize pool. But this weekend felt really, really special in capturing those moments, like you said, Bubbles, that were very like oh, wow, this is cool. This is really high level. This is something special. And Flake, I don't know, again, you've got a lot of experience doing this. If you, you felt that same way with this weekend's event. Well, it's always great to see the best players in the, in the world. It's the same reason why you turn, tune into the NHL or MLB or whatever and sit down and enjoy it and, and get really invested in it is because it's the best players in the world. It's basically they're taking what you enjoy and showing you what it can be about what the best of it can essentially translate to in a competitive environment. These are players that have tens of thousands of reps between all of them, obviously. They have incredible win rates, but eventually something's got to give between them. So uh, you got to give props to players like Tiger who brought unique lineups to the tournament and uh, just sort of straight away from the, the common, I don't want to say common sense, but the common trajectory of where these medalists were going and said, we're going to try something different. We're going to create maybe awkward scenarios, awkward decision lines for you to actually convert on. And, and here we are. So it was really awesome to watch the best do what they do. Absolutely. Let's go ahead and bring up the bracket when we congratulate Tiger one more time for being the first ever OCC Ultimate Champion, taking home the $1,000 grand prize. We see Tiger defeating Birdo 3-2. to two. Tiger arguably having the most challenging path here as well, having defeated No in 5, having defeated Head as well. Um, there you see No in 5 winning the bronze match, finishing third in this enormous event. Our first ever OCC Ultimate. Once again, congratulations, Tiger, for taking it all home. Uh, it seems like, based on our uh, data analysts working hard behind the scenes, that this actually might be Tiger's first ever OCC win and uh, waited for the big one to go ahead and snag that prize pool. So, uh, phenomenal job there, Bubbles. You, uh, I, that I like that you, that you say data analysts as if we've got some professional who, who's come in and done this for us, when in reality it's Jake. <laughs> And Jake King is just feeding us information in the background. 
that was that was the best part in our in our like backstage chat you got spoos going uh tiger's never won an event before and mark the goes, says who like data analyst who's your data analyst jaking <laughs> <laughs> um but it is it is that's you know that's something else that i think is absolutely wonderful about uh about the cards and the community itself and we've had so many um times that that's come forward where you've got players helping each other out you have players just being so kind behind the scenes wishing each other all the best you've got you know uh spooze and jaking who and i mean spooze is pretty good at it himself of having that history of cards in the background of you know, who has won what and what are their head to head matchups and what are their prize pool winnings? Darkness had kept the spreadsheet forever of like, how much money am I making here? Um, and it's just cool to see the community come together and hopefully with, you know, the extra support from 1939, Eileen talking about it during that, uh, that little segment we had of more players, more tournament organizers, more casters coming into the scene and just doing more about this game. Cause I think one really, really special part about it is that community. And I just just to add on that, it is really nice to look at this OCC and see in it some of the nicest players in cards and Berta. <laughs> I um I, I I think we just leave it at that. I don't think there's anything more to say. I don't think there's anything more to add. Huge congratulations to Tiger for winning our first ever OCC Ultimate. Thank you, Bubbles. Thank you, Flake, Spooze, and Darkness. Phenomenal job today. Eileen and uh, Mark Theus in the back pressing all of the buttons. We appreciate each and every one of you. But most importantly, we appreciate you for tuning in, for playing this game. We'll see you out there on the ladder.